Section 1 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prologue and Interviewer's Questions read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses read by Ted DeLorme. Interview Title Orators and Oratory Published in The Sketch, London, England, March 21st, 1894 Prologue It was at his own law office in New York City that I had my talk with that very notable American, Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Bob Ingersoll, Americans call him affectionately. In a company of friends, it is the Colonel a more interesting personality it would be hard to find and those who know even a little of him will tell you that a bigger-hearted man probably does not live suppose a well-knit frame grown stouter than it once was and a fine strong face with a vivid gleam in the eyes a deep uncommonly musical voice clear-cut decisive and a manner entirely delightful yet tinged with a certain reserve introduce a smoking cigar the smoke rising in little curls and billows then imagine a rugged sort of picturesqueness in dress and you get not by any means the man but still some notion of bob ingersoll colonel ingersoll stands at the front of american orators the natural thing therefore was that i should ask him a master in the art about oratory what he said i shall give in his own words precisely as i took them down from his lips for in the case of such a good commander of the old english tongue that is of some importance but the wonderful limpidness the charming pellucidness of ingersoll can only be adequately understood when you also have the finishing touch of his facile voice first question I should be glad if you would tell me what you think the differences are between English and American oratory. There is no difference between the real English and the real American orator. Oratory is the same the world over. The man who thinks on his feet, who has the pose of passion, the face that thought illumines, a voice in harmony with the ideals expressed who has logic like a column and poetry like a vine who transfigures the common dresses the ideals of the people in purple and fine linen who has the art of finding the best and noblest in his hearers and who in a thousand ways creates the climate in which the best grows and flourishes and bursts into blossom that man is an orator no matter of what time of what country if you were to compare individual english and american orators recent or living orators in particular what would you say i have never heard any of the great english speakers and consequently can pass no judgment as to their merits except such as depends on reading I think, however, the finest paragraph ever uttered in Great Britain was by Curran in his defense of Rowan. I have never read one of Mr. Gladstone's speeches, only fragments. I think he lacks logic. Bright was a great speaker, but he lacked imagination and the creative faculty. Disraeli spoke for the clubs, and his speeches were artificial. We have had several fine speakers in America. I think that Thomas Corwin stands at the top of the natural orators. Sergeant S. Prentice, the lawyer, was a very great talker. Henry Ward Beecher was the greatest orator that the pulpit has produced. Theodore Parker was a great orator. In this country, however, probably Daniel Webster occupies the highest place in general esteem. Which would you say are the better orators, speaking generally, the American people or the English people? I think Americans are, on the average, better talkers than the English. I think England has produced the greatest literature of the world, but I do not think England has produced the greatest orators of the world. 
I know of no English orator equal to Webster or Corwin or Beecher. Would you mind telling me how it was you came to be a public speaker, a lecturer, an orator? We call this America of ours free, and yet I found it was very far from free. Our writers and our speakers declared that here in America church and state were divorced. I found this to be untrue. I found that the church was supported by the state in many ways, that people who failed to believe certain portions of the creeds were not allowed to testify in courts or to hold office. It occurred to me that some one ought to do something toward making this country intellectually free, and after a while I thought that I might as well endeavor to do this as wait for another. This is the way in which I came to make speeches. It was an action in favor of liberty. I have said things because I wanted to say them, and because I thought they ought to be said. Perhaps you will tell me your methods as a speaker, for I'm sure it would be interesting to know them. Sometimes, and frequently, I deliver a lecture several times before it is written. I have it taken by a shorthand writer and afterwards written out. At other times I have dictated a lecture and delivered it from manuscript. The course pursued depends on how I happen to feel at the time. Sometimes I read a lecture, and sometimes I deliver lectures without any notes, this again depending much on how I happen to feel. So far as methods are concerned, everything should depend on feeling. Attitude, gestures, voice, emphasis should all be in accord with and spring from feeling, from the inside. Is there any possibility of your coming to England, and, I need hardly add, of your coming to speak? I have thought of going over to England, and I may do so. There is an England in England for which I have the highest possible admiration, the England of culture, of art, of principle. End of Orators and Oratory Section 2 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Question, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Response, read by Ted DeLorme. Interview Title, How to Become an Orator. Printed in the New York Sun, April 1898. Question. What advice would you give a young man who was ambitious to become a successful public speaker or orator? In the first place, I would advise him to have something to say, something worth saying, something that people would be glad to hear. This is the important thing. Back of the art of speaking must be the power to think. Without thoughts, words are empty purses. Most people imagine that almost any words uttered in a loud voice and accompanied by appropriate gestures constitute an oration. I would advise the young man to study his subject, to find what others had thought, to look at it from all sides. Then I would tell him to write out his thoughts or to arrange them in his mind so that he would know exactly what he was going to say. Waste no time on the how until you are satisfied with the what. After you know what you are to say, then you can think of how it should be said. Then you can think about tone, emphasis, and gesture. But if you really understand what you say, emphasis, tone, and gesture will take care of themselves. All these should come from the inside. They should be in perfect harmony with the feelings. Voice and gesture should be governed by the emotions. They should unconsciously be in perfect agreement with the sentiments. The orator should be true to his subject, 
should avoid any reference to himself the great column of his argument should be unbroken he can adorn it with vines and flowers but they should not be in such profusion as to hide the column he should give variety of episode by illustrations but they should be used only for the purpose of adding strength to the argument the man who wishes to become an orator should study language he should know the deeper meaning of words he should understand the vigor and velocity of verbs and the color of adjectives he should know how to sketch a scene to paint a picture to give life and action he should be a poet and a dramatist a painter and an actor he should cultivate his imagination he should become familiar with the great poetry and fiction with splendid and heroic deeds he should be a student of shakespeare he should read and devour the great plays from shakespeare he could learn the art of expression of compassion and all the secrets of the head and heart the great orator is full of variety of surprises like a juggler he keeps the colored balls in the air he expresses himself in pictures his speech is a panorama by continued change he holds the attention the interest does not flag he does not allow himself to be anticipated a picture is shown but once so an orator should avoid the commonplace there should be no stuffing no filling he should put no cotton with his silk no common metals with his gold he should remember that gilded dust is not as good as dusted gold the great orator is honest sincere he does not pretend his brain and heart go together every drop of his blood is convinced nothing is forced he knows exactly what he wishes to do knows when he has finished it and stops only a great orator knows when and how to close most speakers go on after they are through they are satisfied only with a lame and impotent conclusion most speakers lack variety they travel a straight and dusty road the great orator is full of episode he convinces and charms by indirection he leaves the road visits the fields wanders in the woods listens to the murmurs of springs the songs of birds he gathers flowers scales the crags and comes back to the highway refreshed invigorated he does not move in a straight line he wanders and winds like a stream of course no one can tell a man what to do to become an orator the great orator has that wonderful thing called presence he has that strange something known as magnetism he must have a flexible musical voice capable of expressing the pathetic the humorous the heroic his body must move in unison with his thought he must be a reasoner a logician he must have a keen sense of humor of the laughable he must have wit sharp and quick he must have sympathy his smiles should be the neighbors of his tears he must have imagination he should give eagles to the air and painted moths should flutter in the sunlight while i cannot tell a man what to do to become an orator i can tell him a few things not to do there should be no introduction to an oration the orator should commence with his subject there should be no prelude no flourish no apology no explanation he should say nothing about himself like a sculptor he stands by his block of stone every stroke is for a purpose as he works the form begins to appear when the statue is finished the workman stops nothing is more difficult than a perfect close few poems few pieces of music few novels end well a good story a great speech a perfect poem should end just at the proper point the bud the blossom the fruit no delay 
a great speech is a crystallization in its logic an efflorescence in its poetry i have not heard many speeches most of the great speakers in our country were before my time i heard beecher and he was an orator he had imagination humor and intensity his brain was as fertile as the valleys of the tropics he was too broad too philosophic too poetic for the pulpit now and then he broke the fetters of his creed escaped from his orthodox prison and became sublime theodore parker was an orator he preached great sermons his sermons on old age and webster and his address on liberty were filled with great thoughts marvelously expressed when he dealt with human events with realities with things he knew he was superb when he spoke of freedom of duty of living to the ideal of mental integrity he seemed inspired webster i never heard he had great qualities force dignity clearness grandeur but after all he worshipped the past he kept his back to the sunrise there was no dawn in his brain he was not creative he had no spirit of prophecy he lighted no torch he was not true to his ideal he talked sometimes as though his head was among the stars but he stood in the gutter in the name of religion he tried to break the will of stephen gerard to destroy the greatest charity in all the world and in the name of the same religion he defended the fugitive slave law his purpose was the same in both cases he wanted office yet he uttered a few very great paragraphs rich with thought perfectly expressed clay i never heard but he must have had a commanding presence a chivalric bearing an heroic voice he cared little for the past he was a natural leader a wonderful talker forcible persuasive convincing he was not a poet not a master of metaphor but he was practical he kept in view the end to be accomplished he was the opposite of webster clay was the morning webster the evening clay had large views a wide horizon he was ample vigorous and a little tyrannical benton was thoroughly commonplace he never uttered an inspired word he was an intense egoist no subject was great enough to make him forget himself <laughs> calhoun was a political calvinist narrow logical dogmatic he was not an orator he delivered essays not orations i think it was in eighteen fifty one that cossuth visited this country he was an orator there was no man at that time under our flag who could speak english as well as he in the first speech i read of cossuth's was the line russia is the rock against which the sigh for freedom breaks in this you see the poet the painter the orator s s prentice was an orator but with the recklessness of a gamester he threw his life away he said profound and beautiful things but he lacked application he was uneven disproportioned saying ordinary things on great occasions and now and then without the slightest provocation uttering the sublimest and most beautiful thoughts in my judgment corwin was the greatest orator of them all he had more arrows in his quiver he had genius he was full of humor pathos wit and logic he was an actor his body talked his meaning was in his eyes and lips governor o p morton of indiana had the greatest power of statement of any man i have ever heard all the argument was in his statement the facts were perfectly grouped the conclusion was a necessity the best political speech i ever heard was made by governor richard j oglesby of illinois it had every element of greatness reason humor wit pathos imagination and perfect naturalness 
that was in the grand years long ago lincoln had reason wonderful humor and wit but his presence was not good his voice was poor his gestures awkward but his thoughts were profound his speech at gettysburg is one of the masterpieces of the world the word here is used four or five times too often leave the hears out and the speech is perfect of course i have heard a great many talkers but orators are few and far between they are produced by victorious nations born in the midst of great events of marvelous achievements they utter the thoughts the aspirations of their age they clothe the children of the people in the gorgeous robes of giants they interpret the dreams with the poets they prophesy they fill the future with heroic forms with lofty deeds they keep their faces toward the dawn toward the ever-coming day end of how to become an orator Section 3 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prologue and Interviewer's Question, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Response, read by Claudia Salto. Interview Title, My Belief and Unbelief. Printed in The Blade, Toledo, Ohio, January 9th. 1892. Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll was in Toledo for a few hours yesterday afternoon on railroad business. Whatever Mr. Ingersoll says is always read with interest, for besides the independence of his averments, his ideas are worded in a way that in itself is attractive. While in the courtroom talking with some of the officials and others, he was saying that in this world there is rather an unequal distribution of comforts, rewards, and punishments. For himself, he had fared pretty well. He stated that during the thirty years he has been married, there have been fifteen to twenty of his relatives under the same roof, but never had there been in his family a death or a night's loss of sleep on account of sickness. The Lord has been pretty good to you, suggested Marshall Wade well i've been pretty good to him he answered interviewer's question i have heard people in discussing yourself and your views express the belief that way down in the depths of your mind you're not altogether a disbeliever are they in any sense correct ingersoll's answer i am an unbeliever and i am a believer I do not believe in the miraculous, the supernatural, or the impossible. I do not believe in the mosaic account of the creation, or in the flood, or the tower of Babel, or that General Joshua turned back the sun or stopped the earth. I do not believe in the Jonah story, or that God and the devil troubled poor Job neither do i believe in the mount sinai business and i have my doubts about the broiled quails furnished in the wilderness neither do i believe that man is wholly depraved i have not the least faith in the eden snake and apple story neither do i believe that god is an eternal jailer that he is going to be the warden of an everlasting penitentiary in which the most of men are to be eternally tormented. I do not believe that any man can be justly punished or rewarded on account of his belief. But I do believe in the nobility of human nature. I believe in love and home and kindness and humanity. I believe in good fellowship and cheerfulness, and making wife and children happy. I believe in good nature, in giving to others all the rights that you claim for yourself. I believe in free thought, in reason, observation, and experience. I believe in self-reliance 
and in expressing your honest thought i have hope for the whole human race what will happen to one will i hope happen to all and that i hope will be good above all i believe in liberty End of My Belief and Unbelief Section 4 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Claudia Salto interview title a reply to the reverend l a banks printed in the plain dealer cleveland ohio eighteen ninety eight interviewers first question have you read the remarks made about you by the reverend mr banks and what do you think of what he said the reverend gentleman pays me a great compliment by comparing me to a circus everybody enjoys the circus they love to see the acrobats the walkers on the tightrope the beautiful girls on the horses and they laugh at the wit of the clowns they are delighted with the jugglers with the music of the band they drink the lemonade eat the colored popcorn and laugh until they nearly roll off their seats now the circus has a few animals so that christians can have an excuse for going think of the joy the circus gives to the boys and girls they look at the show bills see the men and women flying through the air bursting through paper hoops the elephants standing on their heads and the clowns in curious clothes with hands on their knees and open mouths supposed to be filled with laughter all the boys and girls for many miles around know the blessed day they save their money obey their parents and when the circus comes they are on hand they see the procession and then they see the show they are all happy no sermon ever pleased them as much and in comparison even the sunday school is tame and dull to feel that i have given as much joy as the circus fills me with pleasure what chance would the reverend dr banks stand against a circus the reverend gentleman has done me a great honor and i tender him my sincere thanks Dr. Banks says that you write only one lecture a year, while preachers write a brand new one every week. That if you did that, people would tire of you. What have you to say to that? It may be that great artists paint only one picture a year, and it may be that sign painters can do several jobs a day. Still, I would not say that the sign painters were superior to the artists. There is quite a difference between a sculptor and a stone cutter. There are thousands of preachers and thousands and thousands of sermons preached every year. Has any orthodox minister in the year 1898 given just one paragraph to literature? Has any orthodox preacher uttered one great thought, clothed in perfect English, that thrilled the hearers like music? One great strophe that became one of the treasures of memory? I will make the question a little clearer. Has any orthodox preacher, or any preacher in an orthodox pulpit, uttered a paragraph of what may be called sculptured speech since henry ward beecher died i do not wonder that the sermons are poor their doctrines have been discussed for centuries 
there is little chance for originality they not only thresh old straw but they thresh straw that has been threshed a million times straw in which there has not been a grain of wheat for hundreds of years no wonder that they have nervous prostration no wonder that they need vacations and no wonder that their congregations enjoy the vacations as keenly as the ministers themselves better deliver a real good address fifty-two times than fifty-two poor ones just for the sake of variety dr banks says that the tendency at present is not toward agnosticism but toward christianity what is your opinion when i was a boy infidels were very rare a man who denied the inspiration of the bible was regarded as a monster now there are in this country millions who regard the bible as the work of ignorant and superstitious men a few years ago the bible was the standard all scientific theories were tested by the bible now science is the standard and the bible is tested by that dr banks did not mention the names of the great scientists who are or were christians but he probably thought of laplace humboldt haeckel huxley spencer tyndall darwin helmholtz and draper when he spoke of christian statesmen he likely thought of jefferson franklin washington payne and lincoln or he may have thought of pierce fillmore and buchanan but after all there is no argument in names a man is not necessarily great because he holds office or wears a crown or talks in a pulpit facts reasons are better than names but it seems to me that nothing can be plainer than that the church is losing ground that the people are discarding the creeds and that superstition has passed the zenith of its power dr banks says that christ did not mention the western hemisphere because god does nothing for men that they can do for themselves what have you to say christ said nothing about the western hemisphere because he did not know that it existed he did not know the shape of the earth he was not a scientist never even hinted at any science never told anybody to investigate to think his idea was that this life should be spent in preparing for the next for all the evils of this life and the next faith was his remedy i see from the report in the paper that dr banks after making the remarks about me preached a sermon on herod the villain in the drama of christ who made herod dr banks will answer that god made him did god know what herod would do yes did he know that he would cause the children to be slaughtered in his vain efforts to kill the infant christ yes dr banks will say that god is not responsible for herod because he gave herod freedom did god know how herod would use this freedom did he know that he would become the villain in the drama of christ yes who then is really responsible for the acts of herod if i could change a stone into a human being and if i could give this being freedom of will and if i knew that if i made him he would murder a man and if with that knowledge i made him and he did commit a murder who would be the real murderer will dr banks in his fifty-two sermons of next year show that his god is not responsible for the crimes of herod 
no doubt dr banks is a good man and no doubt he thinks that liberty of thought leads to hell and honestly believes that all doubt comes from the devil i do not blame him he thinks as he must he is a product of conditions he ought to be my friend because i am doing the best i can to civilize his congregation End of A Reply to the Rev. L. A. Banks Section 5 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Claudia Salto interviewed title mrs van cott the revivalist published in the express buffalo new york february 1878 first question i see colonel that in an interview published this morning mrs van cott the revivalist calls you quote a poor barking dog do you know her personally ingersoll's answer I have never met or seen her. Do you know the reason she applied the epithet? I suppose it to be the natural result of what is called vital piety, that is to say, universal love breeds individual hatred. Do you intend making any reply to what she says? I have written her a note of which this is a copy. Buffalo, February twenty fourth, eighteen seventy eight. Mrs. Van Cott. My dear madam, were you constrained by the love of Christ to call a man who has never injured you a poor barking dog? Did you make this remark as a Christian or as a lady? Did you say these words to illustrate in some faint degree the refining influence upon women of the religion you preach? What would you think of me if I should retort, using your language, changing only the sex of the last word? I have the honor to remain yours truly, R. G. Ingersoll. Well, what do you think of the religious revival system generally? The fire that has to be blown all the time is a poor thing to get warm by. I regard these revivals as essentially barbaric. I think they do no good but much harm. They make innocent people think they are guilty, and very mean people think they are good. What is your opinion concerning women as conductors of these revivals? I suppose those engaged in them think they are doing good. They are probably honest. I think, however, that neither men nor women should be engaged in frightening people into heaven. That is all I wish to say on the subject, as I do not think it worth talking about. End of Mrs. Van Cott, The Revivalist Section 6 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England interview title reply to chicago critics printed in the chicago tribune september thirtieth eighteen eighty first question have you read the replies of the clergy to your recent lecture in this city on what must we do to be saved and if so what do you think of them i think they dodge the point the real point is this if salvation by faith is the real doctrine of christianity i asked on sunday before last and i still ask why didn't matthew tell it 
i still insist that mark should have remembered it and i shall always believe that luke ought at least to have noticed it i was endeavouring to show that modern christianity has for its basis an interpolation i think i showed it the only gospel on the orthodox side is that of john and that was certainly not written or did not appear in its present form until long after the others were written i know very well that the catholic church claimed during the dark ages and still claims that references had been made to the gospels by persons living in the first second and third centuries but i believe such manuscripts were manufactured by the catholic church for many years in europe there was not one person in twenty thousand who could read and write during that time the church had in its keeping the literature of our world they interpolated as they pleased they created they destroyed in other words they did whatever in their opinion was necessary to substantiate the faith the gentleman who saw fit to reply did not answer the question and i again call upon the clergy to explain to the people why if salvation depends upon the belief on the lord jesus christ matthew didn't mention it someone has said that christ didn't make known his doctrine of salvation by belief or faith until after his resurrection certainly none of the gospels were written until after his resurrection and if he made that doctrine known after his resurrection and before his ascension it should have been in matthew mark and luke as well as in john the replies of the clergy show that they have not investigated the subject that they are not well acquainted with the new testament in other words they have not read it except with a regulation theological bias there is one thing i wish to correct here in an editorial in the tribune it was stated that i had admitted that christ was beyond and above buddha zorastor confucius and others i did not say so another point was made against me and those who made it seemed to think it was a good one in my lecture i asked why it was that the disciples of christ wrote in greek whereas in fact they understood only hebrew it is now claimed that greek was the language of jerusalem at that time that hebrew had fallen into disuse that no one understood it except the literati and the highly educated if i fell into an error upon this point it was because i relied upon the new testament i find in the twenty-first chapter of the acts an account of paul having been mobbed in the city of jerusalem that he was protected by a chief captain and some soldiers that while upon the stairs of the castle to which he was being taken for protection he obtained leave from the captain to speak unto the people in the fortieth verse of that chapter i find the following and when he had given him license paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with a hand unto the people and when there was made a great silence he spake unto them in the hebrew tongue saying and then follows the speech of paul wherein he gives an account of his conversion it seems a little curious to me that paul for the purpose of quieting a mob would speak to that mob in an unknown language if i were mobbed in the city of chicago and wished to defend myself with an explanation i certainly would not make that explanation in choctaw even if i understood that tongue my present opinion is that i would speak in english and the reason i would speak in english is because that language is generally understood in this city and so i conclude from the account in the twenty-first chapter of the acts that hebrew was the language of jerusalem at that time or paul would not have addressed the mob in that tongue did you read mr courtney's answer i read what mr courtney read from others and think some of his quotations very good and have no doubt that the authors will feel complimented by being quoted there certainly is no need of me answering dr courtney sometime i may answer the french gentleman from whom he quoted but what about there being belief in matthew mr courtney says that certain people were cured of diseases on account of faith admitting that mumps measles and whooping cough could be cured in that way there is not even a suggestion that salvation depended upon a like faith i think he can hardly afford to rely upon the miracles of the new testament to prove his doctrine there was one instance in which a miracle was performed by christ without his knowledge 
and I hardly think that even Mr. Courtney would insist that any faith could have been great enough for that. The fact is, I believe that all these miracles were ascribed to Christ long after his death, and that Christ never, at any time or place, pretended to have any supernatural power whatever. Neither do I believe that he claimed any supernatural origin. He claimed simply to be a man, no less, no more. I do not believe Mr. Courtney is satisfied with his own reply. And now as to Professor Swing. Mr. Swing has been out of the Orthodox Church so long that he seems to have forgotten the reasons for which he left it. I do not believe there is an Orthodox minister in the city of Chicago who will agree with Mr. Swing that salvation by faith is no longer preached. Professor Swing seems to think it is of no importance who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. In this I agree with him. Judging from what he said, there is hardly difference enough of opinion between us to justify a reply on his part. He, however, makes one mistake. I did not in the lecture say one word about tearing down churches. I have no objection to people building all the churches they wish. While I admit it is a pretty sight to see children on a morning in June going through the fields to the country church, I still insist that the beauty of that sight does not answer the question how it is that Matthew forgot to say anything about salvation through Christ. Professor Swing is a man of poetic temperament, but this is not a poetic question. How did the card of Dr. Thomas strike you? I think the reply of Dr. Thomas is in the best possible spirit. I regard him today as the best intellect in the Methodist denomination. He seems to have what is generally understood as a Christian spirit. He has always treated me with perfect fairness, and I should have said long ago many grateful things had I not feared I might hurt him with his own people. He seems to be by nature a perfectly fair man, and I know of no man in the United States for whom I have a profounder respect. Of course, I don't agree with Dr. Thomas. I think in many things he is mistaken, but I believe him to be perfectly sincere. There is one trouble about him. He is growing, and this fact will no doubt give great trouble to many of his brethren. Certain Methodist Hazelbrush feel a little uneasy in the shadow of his oak. To see the difference between him and some others, all that is necessary is to read his reply, and then read the remarks made at the Methodist minister's meeting on the Monday following. Compared with Dr. Thomas, they are as puddles by the sea. There is the same difference that there is between sewers and rivers, cesspools and springs. What have you to say to the remarks of the Reverend Dr. Jewett before the Methodist minister's meeting? I think Dr. Jewett is extremely foolish. I did not say that I would commence suit against a minister for libel. I can hardly conceive of a proceeding that would be less liable to produce a dividend. The fact about it is that the Reverend Mr. Jewett seems to think anything true that he hears against me. Mr. Jewett is probably ashamed of what he said by this time. He must have known it to be entirely false. It seems to me, by this time, even the most bigoted should lose their confidence in falsehood. Of course, there are times when a falsehood, well told, bridges over quite a difficulty. But in the long run you had better tell the truth, even if you swim the creek. I am astonished that these ministers were willing to exhibit their wounds to the world. I suppose, of course, I would hit some, but I had no idea of wounding so many. Mr. Crafts stated that you were in the habit of swearing in company and before your family. I often swear. In other words, I take the name of God in vain. That is to say, I take it without any practical thing resulting from it. And in that sense, I think most ministers are guilty of the same thing. I heard an old story of a clergyman who rebuked a neighbor for swearing, to whom the neighbor replied, You pray, and I swear. But as a matter of fact, neither of us means anything by it. As to the charge that I am in the habit of using indecent language in my family, no reply is needed. I am willing to leave that question to the people who know us both. Mr. Crafts says he was told this by a lady. This cannot by any possibility be true, for no lady will tell a falsehood. 
Besides, if this woman of whom he speaks was a lady, how did she happen to stay where obscene language was being used? No lady ever told Mr. Crafts any such thing. It may be that a lady did tell him that I used profane language. I admit that I have not always spoken of the devil in a respectful way, that I have sometimes referred to his residence when it was not a necessary part of the conversation, and that at divers times I have used a good deal of the terminology of the theologian when the exact words of the scientist might have done as well. But if by swearing is meant the use of God's name in vain, there are very few preachers who do not swear more than I do. If by in vain is meant without any practical result. I leave Mr. Crafts to cultivate the acquaintance of the unknown lady, knowing as I do that after they have talked this matter over again, they will find that both have been mistaken. I sincerely regret the clergymen, who really believe that an infinite God is on their side, think it necessary to resort to such things to defeat one man. According to their idea, God is against me, and they ought to have confidence in his infinite wisdom and strength to suppose that he could dispose of one man, even if they fail to say a word against me. Had you not asked me, I should have said nothing to you on these topics. Such charges cannot hurt me. I do not believe it possible for such men to injure me. No one believes what they say, and the testimony of such clergymen against an infidel is no longer considered of value. I believe it was Goeth who said, I always know that I am travelling when I hear the dogs bark. Are you going to make a formal reply to their sermons? not unless something better is done than has been. Of course, I don't know what another Sabbath may bring forth. I am waiting. But of one thing I feel perfectly assured, that no man in the United States or in the world can account for the fact, if we are to be saved only by faith in Christ, that Matthew forgot it, that Luke said nothing about it, and that Mark never mentioned it, except in two passages written by another person. Until that is answered, as one grave-digger says to the other in Hamlet, I shall say, Ah, tell me that, and unyoke. In the meantime, I wish to keep on the best terms with all parties concerned. I cannot see why my forgiving spirit fails to gain their sincere praise. End of Reply to Chicago Critics Section 7 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Scott Daneker, Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Interview Title, Miracles and Immortality. Printed in The Dispatch. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, December 11, 1880. First question. You have seen some accounts of the recent sermon of Dr. Tyne on miracles, I presume, and if so, what is your opinion of the sermon, and also, what is your opinion of miracles? Ingersoll's answer. From an orthodox standpoint, I think the Reverend Dr. Tyne is right. If miracles were necessary 1,800 years ago, before scientific facts enough were known to overthrow hundreds and thousands of passages in the Bible, certainly they're necessary now. Dr. Tying sees clearly that the old miracles are nearly worn out, and that some new ones are absolutely essential. He takes for granted that, if God would do a miracle to found his gospel, he certainly would do some more to preserve it and that it is in need of preservation about now, is evident. I am amazed that the religious world should laugh at him for believing in miracles. It seems to me just as reasonable that the deaf, dumb, blind, and lame should be cured at Lourdes as in Palestine. It certainly is no more wonderful that the law of nature should be broken now than that it was broken several thousand years ago. Dr. Tying also has this advantage. The witnesses by whom he proves these miracles are alive. 
an unbeliever can have the opportunity of cross-examination, whereas the miracles in the New Testament are substantiated only by the dead. It is just as reasonable to me that blind people receive their sight in France as that devils were made to vacate human bodies in the Holy Land. For one, I am exceedingly glad that Dr. Tyne has taken this position. It shows that he is a believer in a personal God, in a God who is attending a little to the affairs of this world, and in a God who did not exhaust his supplies in the apostolic age. It is refreshing to me to find in this scientific age a gentleman who still believes in miracles. My opinion is that all thorough religionists will have to take the ground and admit that a supernatural religion must be supernaturally preserved. I have been asking for a miracle for several years, and have in a very mild, gentle, and loving way taunted the church for not producing a little one. I have had the impudence to ask any number of them to join in a prayer, asking anything they desire for the purpose of testing the efficiency of what is known as supplication. They answer me by calling my attention to the miracles recorded in the New Testament. I insist, however, on a new miracle, and personally I would like to see one now. Certainly the infinite has not lost his power, and certainly the infinite knows that thousands and hundreds of thousands, if the Bible is true, are now pouring over the precipice of unbelief into the gulf of hell. One little miracle would save thousands. One little miracle in Pittsburgh, well authenticated, would do more good than all the preaching ever heard in this sooty town. The Reverend Dr. Tyne clearly sees this, and he has been driven to the conclusion, first, that God can do miracles, second, that he ought to, and third, that he has. In this he is perfectly logical. After a man believes the Bible, after he believes in the flood and the story of Jonah, certainly he ought not to hesitate at a miracle of today. When I say I want a miracle, I mean by that I want a good one. All miracles recorded in the New Testament could have been simulated. A fellow could have pretended to be dead, or blind, or dumb, or deaf. I want to see a good miracle. I want to see a man with one leg, and then I want to see the other leg grow out. I would like to see a miracle like that performed in North Carolina. Two men were disputing about the relative merits of a salve they had for sale. One of the men, in order to demonstrate that his salve was better than any other, cut off a dog's tail and applied a little of the salve to the stump, and in the presence of the spectators a new tail grew out. But the other man, who also had a salve for sale, took the piece of the tail that had been cast away, put a little salve at the end of that, and a new dog grew out. And the last turn of those parties, they were quarreling as to who owned the second dog. A something like that is what I call a miracle. What do you believe about the immortality of the soul? Do you believe that the spirit lives as an individual after the body is dead? I've said a great many times that it is no more wonderful that we should live again than that we do live. Sometimes I've thought it not quite so wonderful for the reason that we have a start. But upon that subject, I haven't the slightest information. Whether man lives again or not, I cannot pretend to say. There may be another world, and there may not be. If there is another world, we ought to make the best of it after arriving there. If there is not another world, or if there is another world, we ought to make the best of this. And since nobody knows, all should be permitted to have their opinions. And my opinion is that nobody knows if we take the old testament for authority man is not immortal the old testament shows man how he lost his immortality according to genesis god prevented man from putting forth his hand and eating of the tree of life it is there stated had he succeeded man would have lived forever 
god drove him from this garden preventing him from eating of this tree and in consequence man became mortal so that if we go by the old testament we are compelled to give up immortality the new testament has but little on the subject in one place we are told to seek for immortality if we are already immortal it's hard to see why we should go on seeking for it in another place we are told that they who are worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection of the dead are not given in marriage from this one would infer there would be some unworthy to be raised from the dead upon the question of immortality the old testament throws but little satisfactory light i don't deny immortality nor would i endeavor to shake the belief of anybody in another life what i am endeavoring to do is to put out the fires of hell if we cannot have heaven without hell i am in favor of abolishing heaven i do not want to go to heaven if one soul is doomed to agony i would rather be annihilated my opinion of immortality is this first i live and that of itself is infinitely wonderful second there was a time when i was not and after i was not i was third now that i am i may be again and it is no more wonderful that i may be again if i have been than that i am having once been nothing if the churches advocated immortality if they advocated eternal justice if they said that man would be rewarded and punished according to deeds if they admitted that some time in eternity there would be an opportunity given to lift up souls and that throughout all the ages the angels of progress and virtue would beckon the fallen upward and that some time and no matter how far away they might put off the time all children of men would be reasonably happy i never would say a solitary word against the church but as long as they preach that the majority of mankind will suffer eternal pain just so long shall i oppose them that is to say as long as i live do you believe in a god and if so what kind of a god let me in the first place lay a foundation for an answer first man gets all food for thought through the medium of the senses the effect of nature upon the senses and through the senses upon the brain must be natural all food for thought then is natural as a consequence of this there can be no supernatural idea in the human brain whatever idea there is must have been a natural product if then there is no supernatural idea in the human brain then there cannot be in the human brain an idea of the supernatural if we can have no idea of the supernatural and if the god of whom you spoke is admitted to be supernatural then of course i can have no idea of him and i certainly can have no very fixed belief on any subject about which i have no idea there may be a god for all i know there may be thousands of them but the idea of an infinite being outside and independent of nature is inconceivable i do not know of any word that would explain my doctrine or my views upon the subject i suppose pantheism is as near as i can go i believe in the eternity of matter and in the eternity of intelligence but i do not believe in any being outside of nature i don't believe in any personal deity i don't believe in any aristocracy of the air i know nothing about origin or destiny between these two horizons i live whether i wish to or not 
and must be satisfied with what I find between these two horizons. I have never heard any God described that I believe in. I have never heard any religion explained that I accept. To make something out of nothing cannot be more absurd than that an infinite intelligence made this world and proceeded to fill it with crime and want and agony, and then, not satisfied with the evil he had wrought, made a hell in which to consummate the great mistake. Do you believe that the world and all that is in it came by chance? I don't believe anything comes by chance. I regard the present as the necessary child of a necessary past. I believe matter is eternal, that it has eternally existed, and eternally will exist. I believe that in all matter, in some way, there is what we call force, that one of the forms of force is intelligence. I believe that whatever is in the universe has existed from eternity and will forever exist. Secondly, I exclude from my philosophy all ideas of chance. Matter changes eternally its form, never its essence. You cannot conceive of anything being created. No one can conceive of anything existing without a cause, or with a cause. Let me explain. A thing is not a cause until an effect has been produced, so that, after all, cause and effect are twins, coming into life at precisely the same instant, born of the womb of an unknown mother. The universe is the only fact, and everything that ever has happened, is happening, or will happen, are but the different aspects of the one eternal fact. This concludes our interview, Miracles and Immortality. Section 8 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prologue and Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. Interview Title, Psychical Research and the Bible. Printed in Mind, New York, March 1899. As an incident in the life of anyone favored with the privilege, a visit to the home of Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll is certain to be recalled as a most pleasant and profitable experience. Although not a sympathizer with the great agnostic's religious views, yet I have long admired his ability, his humor, his intellectual honesty and courage and it was with gratification that i accepted the good offices of a common friend who recently offered to introduce me to the ingersoll domestic circle in gramercy park here i found the genial colonel surrounded by his children his grandchildren and his amiable wife whose smiling greeting dispelled formality and breathed welcome in every syllable the family relationship seemed absolutely ideal the very walls emitting an atmosphere of art and music, of contentment and companionship, of mutual trust, happiness, and generosity. But my chief desire was to elicit Colonel Ingersoll's personal views on questions related to the new thought and its attitude on matters on which he is known to have very decided opinions. My request for a private chat was cordially granted. During the conversation that ensued, the substance of which is presented to the readers of Mind in the following paragraphs, with the Colonel's consent, I was impressed most deeply not by the force of his arguments, but by the sincerity of his convictions. Among some of his more violent opponents, who presumably lack other opportunities of becoming known, it is the fashion to accuse Ingersoll of having really no belief in his own opinions. But 
if he convinced me of little else he certainly without effort satisfied my mind that this accusation is a slander utterly mistaken in his views he may be but if so his errors are more honest than many of those he points out in the king james version of the bible if his pulpit enemies could talk with this man by his own fireside they would pay less attention to ingersoll himself and more to what he says they would consider his meaning rather than his motive as the colonel is the most conspicuous denunciator of intolerance and bigotry in america he has been inevitably the greatest victim of these obstacles to mental freedom to answer ingersoll is the pet ambition of many a young clergyman the older ones have either acquired prudence or are broad enough to concede the utility of even agnostics in the economy of evolution it was with the very subject that we began our talk the uncharitableness of men otherwise good in their treatment of those whose religious views differ from their own first question what is your conception of true intellectual hospitality as truth can brook no compromises has it not the same limitations that surround social and domestic hospitality in the republic of mind we are all equals each one is sceptred and crowned each one is the monarch of his own realm. By intellectual hospitality, I mean the right of everyone to think and to express his thought. It makes no difference whether his thought is right or wrong. If you are intellectually hospitable, you will admit the right of every human being to see for himself, to hear with his own ears, see with his own eyes, and think with his own brain. You will not try to change his thought by force, by persecution, or by slander. You will not threaten him with punishment here or hereafter. You will give him your thought, your reasons, your facts, and there you will stop. This is intellectual hospitality. You do not give up what you believe to be the truth. You do not compromise. You simply give him the liberty you claim for yourself. The truth is not affected by your opinion or by his. Both may be wrong. For many years the Church has claimed to have the truth, and has also insisted that it is the duty of every man to believe it, whether it is reasonable to him or not. This is bigotry in its basest form. Every man should be guided by his reason, should be true to himself, should preserve the veracity of his soul. Each human being should judge for himself. The man that believes that all men have this right is intellectually hospitable. In the sharp distinction between theology and religion that is now recognized by many theologians, and in the liberalizing of the church that has marked the last two decades, are not most of your contentions already granted? Is not the lake of fire and brimstone an obsolete issue? There has been in the last few years a great advance. The orthodox creeds have been growing vulgar and cruel. Civilized people are shocked at the dogma of eternal pain, and the belief in hell has mostly faded away. The churches have not changed their creeds. They still pretend to believe as they always have, but they have changed their tone. God is now a father, a friend. He is no longer the monster, the savage, described in the Bible. He has become somewhat civilized. He no longer claims the right to damn us because he made us. But in spite of all the errors and contradictions, in spite of the cruelties and absurdities found in the Scriptures, the churches still insist that the Bible is inspired. The educated ministers admit that the Pentateuch was not written by Moses that the Psalms were not written by David, that Isaiah was the work of at least three. Daniel was not written until after the prophecies mentioned in that book had been fulfilled, that Ecclesiastes was not written until the second century after Christ, that Solomon's song was not written by Solomon, that the book of Esther is of no importance, and that no one knows or pretends to know who were the authors of Kings, Samuel, Chronicles, or Job, and yet these same gentlemen still cling to the dogma of inspiration. It is no longer claimed that the Bible is true, but inspired. 
yet the sacred volume no matter who wrote it is a mine of wealth to the student and the philosopher is it not would you have us discard it altogether inspiration must be abandoned and the bible must take its place among the books of the world it contains some good passages a little poetry some good sense and some kindness but its philosophy is frightful in fact if the book had never existed i think it would have been far better for mankind it is not enough to give up the bible that is only the beginning the supernatural must be given up it must be admitted that nature has no master that there never has been any interference from without that man has received no help from heaven and that all the prayers that have ever been uttered have died unanswered in the heedless air the religion of the supernatural has been a curse we want the religion of usefulness but have you no use whatever for prayer even in the sense of aspiration or for faith in the sense of confidence in the ultimate triumph of the right there is a difference between wishing hoping believing and knowing we can wish without evidence or probability and we can wish for the impossible for what we believe can never be we cannot hope unless there is in the mind a possibility that the thing hoped for can happen we can believe only in accordance with evidence and we know only that which has been demonstrated I have no use for prayer but I do a good deal of wishing and hoping I hope that some time the right will triumph the truth will gain the victory but I have no faith in gaining the assistance of any God or of any supernatural power I never pray however fully materialism as a philosophy may accord with the merely human reason is it not wholly antagonistic to the instinctive faculties of the mind human reason is the final arbiter any system that does not commend itself to the reason must fall I do not know exactly what you mean by materialism I do not know what matter is I am satisfied however that without matter there can be no force no life no thought no reason it seems to me that mind is a form of force and force cannot exist apart from matter if it is said that God created the universe then there must have been a time when he commenced to create if at that time there was nothing in existence but himself how could he have exerted any force force cannot be exerted except in opposition to force if god was the only existence force could not have been exerted but don't you think colonel that the materialistic philosophy even in the light of your own interpretation is essentially pessimistic i do not consider it so i believe that the pessimists and the optimists are both right this is the worst possible world and this is the best possible world because it is as it must be the present is the child and the necessary child of all the past what have you to say concerning the operations of the society for psychical research do not its facts and conclusions prove if not immortality at least the continuity of life beyond the grave are the millions of spiritualists deluded of course i have heard and read a great deal about the doings of the society so i have some knowledge as to what is claimed by spiritualists by theosophists and by all other believers in what are called spiritual manifestations thousands of wonderful things have been established by what is called evidence the testimony of good men and women I have seen things done that I could not explain both by mediums and magicians I also know that it is easy to deceive the senses and that the old saying that seeing is believing is subject to many exceptions I'm perfectly satisfied that there is and can be no force without matter that everything that is all phenomena all actions and thoughts all exhibitions of force have a material basis that nothing exists ever did or ever will exist apart from matter 
so i am satisfied that no matter ever existed or ever will apart from force we think with the same force with which we walk for every action and for every thought we draw upon the store of force that we have gained from air and food we create no force we borrow it all as force cannot exist apart from matter it must be used with matter it travels only on material roads it is impossible to convey a thought to another without the assistance of matter no one can conceive of the use of one of our senses without substance no one can conceive of a thought in the absence of the senses with these conclusions in my mind in my brain i have not the slightest confidence in spiritual manifestations and i do not believe that any message has ever been received from the dead the testimony that i have heard that i have read coming even from men of science has not the slightest weight with me i do not pretend to see beyond the grave i do not say that man is or is not immortal all i say is that there is no evidence that we live again and no demonstration that we do not it is better ignorantly to hope than dishonestly to affirm and what do you think of the modern development of metaphysics as expressed outside of the emotional and semi-ecclesiastical schools i refer especially to the power of mind in the curing of disease as demonstrated by scores of drugless healers i have no doubt that the condition of the mind has some effect upon the health the blood the heart the lungs answer respond to emotion there is no mind without body and the body is affected by thought by passion by cheerfulness by depression still i have not the slightest confidence in what is called mind cure i do not believe that thought or any set of ideas can cure a cancer or prevent the hair from falling out or remove a tumor or even freckles at the same time i admit that cheerfulness is good and depression bad but i have no confidence in what you call drugless healers if the stomach is sour soda is better than thinking if one is in great pain opium will beat meditation I am a believer in what you call drugs, and when I am sick, I send for a physician. I have no confidence in the supernatural. Magic is not medicine. One great object of this movement is to make religion scientific, an aid to intellectual as well as spiritual progress. Is it not thus to be encouraged and destined to succeed, even though it prove the reality and supremacy of the spirit and the secondary importance of the flesh? When religion becomes scientific, it ceases to be religion and becomes science. Religion is not intellectual, it is emotional. It does not appeal to the reason. The founder of a religion has always said, Let him that hath ears to hear, hear. No founder has said, let him that hath brains to think, think. Besides, we need not trouble ourselves about spirit and flesh. We know that we know of no spirit without flesh. We have no evidence that spirit ever did or ever will exist apart from flesh. Such existence is absolutely inconceivable. If we are going to construct what you call a religion, it must be founded on observed and known facts theories to be of value must be in accord with all the facts that are known otherwise they are worthless we need not try to get back of facts or behind the truth the why will forever elude us you cannot move your hand quickly enough to grasp your image back of the mirror end of psychical research and the bible Section 9 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prologue and Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Claudia Salto. Interview Title, Blasphemy, printed in the Philadelphia Press, May 24, 1884. 
quote if robert g ingersoll indulges in blasphemy tonight in his lecture as he has in other places and in this city before he will be arrested before he leaves the city End quote. so spoke rev erwin h torrance general secretary of the pennsylvania bible society yesterday afternoon to a press reporter quote, we have consulted counsel the law is with us and ingersoll has but to do what he has done before to find himself in a cell here is the act of march thirty first eighteen sixty quote if any person shall willfully premeditatedly and despitefully blaspheme or speak loosely and profanely of almighty god jesus christ the holy spirit or the scriptures of truth such person on conviction thereof shall be sentenced to pay a fine not exceeding one hundred dollars and undergo an imprisonment not exceeding three months or either at the discretion of the court End quote last evening colonel ingersoll sat in the dining room at guy's hotel just in from new york city when told of the plans of mr torrance and his friends he laughed and said quote, i did not suppose that anybody was idiotic enough to want me arrested for blasphemy it seems to me that an infinite being can take care of himself without the aid of any agent of a bible society perhaps it is wrong for me to be here while the methodist conference is in session of course no one who differs from the methodist ministers should ever visit philadelphia while they are here i most humbly hope to be forgiven what do you think of the law of eighteen sixty it is exceedingly foolish surely there is no need for the legislature of pennsylvania to protect an infinite god and why should the bible be protected by law the most ignorant priest can hold darwin up to orthodox scorn this talk of the reverend mr torrance shows that my lectures are needed that religious people do not know what real liberty is i presume that the law of eighteen sixty is an old one re-enacted it is a survival of ancient ignorance and bigotry and no one in the legislature thought it worth while to fight it it is the same as the law against swearing both are dead letters and amount to nothing they are not enforced and should not be public opinion will regulate such matters if all who take the name of god in vain were imprisoned there would not be room in the jails to hold the ministers they speak of god in the most flippant and snap your fingers way that can be conceived of they speak to him as though he were an intimate chum and metaphorically slap him on the back in the most familiar way possible have you ever had any similar experiences before oh yes threats have been made but i was never arrested when mr torrance gets cool he will see that he has made a mistake people in philadelphia have been in the habit of calling the citizens of boston bigots but there is more real freedom of thought and expression in boston than in almost any other city of the world i think that as i am to suffer in hell for ever mr torrance ought to be satisfied and let me have a good time here he can amuse himself through all eternity by seeing me in hell and that ought to be enough to satisfy not only an agent but the whole bible society i never expected any trouble in this state and most sincerely hope that mr torrance will not trouble me and make the city a laughing-stock philadelphia has no time to waste in such foolish things let the bible take its chances with other books 
let everybody feel that he has the right freely to express his opinions provided he is decent and kind about it certainly the christians now ought to treat infidels as well as pen did indians nothing could be more perfectly idiotic than in this day and generation to prosecute any man for giving his conclusions upon any religious subject mr torrens would have had huxley and heckle and tyndall arrested would have had humboldt and john stuart mill and harriet martineau and george eliot locked up in the city jail mr torrens is a fossil from the old red sandstone of a mistake let him rest to hear these people talk you would suppose that god is some petty king some lilliputian prince who was about to be dethroned and who was nearly wild for recruits but what would you do if they should make an attempt to arrest you nothing except to defend myself in court end of blasphemy Section 10 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prologue and Ingersoll's Voice, read by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Interview Title, This Century's Glories. Published in The Sun, New York, March 19, 1899. The laurel of the nineteenth century is on Darwin's brow. This century has been the greatest of all. The inventions, the discoveries, the victories on the fields of thought, the advances in nearly every direction of human effort are without parallel in human history. In only two directions have the achievements of this century been excelled. The marbles of Greece have not been equalled they still occupy the niches dedicated to perfection. The sculptors of our century stand before the miracles of the Greeks in impotent wonder. They cannot even copy. They cannot give the breath of life to stone and make the marble feel and think. The plays of Shakespeare have never been approached. He reached the summit, filled the horizon, in the direction of the dramatic, the poetic, the human mind, in my judgment, in Shakespeare's plays, reached its limit. The field was harvested, all the secrets of the heart were told, the buds of all hopes blossomed, all seas were crossed, and all the shores were touched. With these two exceptions, the Grecian marbles and the Shakespeare plays, the nineteenth century has produced more for the benefit of man than all the centuries of the past. In this century, in one direction, I think the mind has reached the limit. I do not believe the music of Wagner will ever be excelled. He changed all passions, longing, memories, and aspirations into tones, and with subtle harmonies wove tapestries of sound, whereon were pictured the past and future, the history and prophecy of the human heart. Of course Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, and Kepler laid the foundations of astronomy. It may be that the three laws of Kepler mark the highest point in that direction that the mind has reached. In the other centuries there is now and then a peak, but through ours there runs a mountain range, with Alp on Alp, the steamship that has conquered all the seas, the railway, with its steeds of steel with breath of flame, covers the land, the cables and telegraphs, along which lightning is the carrier of thought, have made the nation's neighbours, and brought the world to every home. The making of paper from wood, the printing presses that made it possible to give the history of the human race each day, the reapers, mowers, and threshers that superseded the cradles, scythes, and flails, 
the lighting of streets and houses with gas and incandescent lamps changing night into day the invention of matches that made fire the companion of man the process of making steel invented by bessemer saving for the world hundreds of millions a year the discovery of anaesthetics changing pain to happy dreams and making surgery a science the spectrum analysis that told us the secrets of the suns the telephone that transports speech uniting lips and ears the phonograph that holds in dots and marks the echoes of our words the marvellous machines that spin and weave that manufacture the countless things of use the marvellous machines whose wheels and levers seem to think the discoveries in chemistry the wave theory of light the indestructibility of matter and force the discovery of microbes and bacilli so that now the plague can be stayed without the assistance of priests the art of photography became known the sun became an artist gave us the faces of our friends copies of the great paintings and statues pictures of the world's wonders and enriched the eyes of poverty with the spoil of travel the wealth of art the cell theory was advanced embryology was studied and science entered the secret house of life the biologists guided by fossil forms followed the paths of life from protoplasm up to man then came darwin with the origin of species natural selection and the survival of the fittest from his brain there came a flood of light the old theories grew foolish and absurd the temple of every science was rebuilt that which had been called philosophy became childish superstition the prison doors were opened and millions of convicts of unconscious slaves roved with joy over the fenceless fields of freedom darwin and haeckel and huxley and their fellow workers filled the night of ignorance with the glittering stars of truth this is darwin's victory he gained the greatest victory the grandest triumph the laurel of the nineteenth century is on his brow how does the literature of today compare with that of the first half of the century in your opinion there is now no poet of laughter and tears of comedy and pathos the equal of hood there is none with the subtle delicacy the aerial footstep the flame-like motion of shelley none with the amplitude sweep and passion with the strength and beauty the courage and royal recklessness of byron the novelists of our day are not the equals of dickens in my judgment dickens wrote the greatest of all novels the tale of two cities is the supreme work of fiction its philosophy is perfect the characters stand out like living statues in its pages you find the blood and flame the ferocity and self-sacrifice of the french revolution in the bosom of the vengeance is the heart of the horror in 105 north tower sits one whom sorrow drove beyond the verge rescued from death by insanity and we see the spirit of dr manette trembling across the great gulf that lies between the night of dreams and the blessed day where things are as they seem as a tress of golden hair while on his hands and cheeks fall lucy's blessed tears the story is filled with lights and shadows with the tragic and grotesque while the woman knits while the heads fall jerry cruncher gnaws his rusty nails and his poor wife flops against his business and prim miss prose who in the desperation and terror of love held mademoiselle defarge in her arms and who in the flash and crash found that her burden was dead is drawn by the hand of a master and what shall i say of sidney carton of his last walk of his last ride holding the poor girl by the hand is there a more wonderful character in all the realm of fiction sidney carton the perfect lover going to his death for the love of one who loves another 
to me the three greatest novels are the tale of two cities by dickens les miserables by hugo and ariadne by Ouide. les miserables is full of faults and perfections the tragic is sometimes pushed to the grotesque but from the depths it brings the pearls of truth a convict becomes holier than the saint a prostitute purer than the nun this book fills the gutter with the glory of heaven while the waters of the sewer reflect the stars in ariadne you find the aroma of all art it is a classic dream and there too you find that hot blood of full and ample life Guide is the greatest living writer of fiction some of her books i do not like if you wish to know what Guide really is read wanda the dog of flanders the leaf in a storm in these you will hear the beating of her heart most of the novelists of our time write good stories they are ingenious the characters are well drawn but they lack life energy they do not appear to act for themselves impelled by inner force they seem to be pushed and pulled the same may be said of the poets tennyson belongs to the latter half of our century he was undoubtedly a great writer he had no flame or storm no tidal wave nothing volcanic he never overflowed the banks he wrote nothing as intense as noble and pathetic as the prisoner of chalon nothing as purely poetic as the skylark nothing as perfect as the grecian urn and yet he was one of the greatest of poets viewed from all sides he was far greater than shelley far nobler than keats in a few poems shelley reached almost the perfect but many are weak feeble fragmentary almost meaningless so keats in three poems reached a great height in st agnes eve the grecian urn and the nightingale but most of his poetry is insipid without thought beauty or sincerity we have had some poets ourselves emerson wrote many poetic and philosophic lines he never violated any rule he kept his passions under control and generally kept off the grass but he uttered some great and splendid truths and sowed countless seeds of suggestion when we remember that he came of a line of new england preachers we are amazed at the breadth the depth and the freedom of his thought walt whitman wrote a few great poems elemental natural poems that seem to be a part of nature ample as the sky having the rhythm of the tides the swing of a planet whitcomb riley has written poems of hearth and home of love and labor worthy of robert burns he is the sweetest strongest singer in our country and i do not know his equal in any land but when we compare the literature of the first half of this century with that of the last we are compelled to say that the last taken as a whole is best think of the volumes that science has given to the world in the first half of this century sermons orthodox sermons were published and read now reading sermons is one of the lost habits taken as a whole the literature of the latter half of our century is better than the first i like the essays of professor clifford they are so clear so logical that they are poetic herbert spencer is not simply instructive he is charming he is full of true imagination he is not the slave of imagination imagination is his servant huxley wrote like a trained swordsman his thrusts were never parried he had superb courage he never apologized for having an opinion there was never on his soul the stain of evasion he was as candid as the truth heckel is a great writer because he reveres a fact and would not for his life deny or misinterpret one he tells what he knows with the candor of a child and defends his conclusions like a scientist a philosopher he stands next to darwin coming back to fiction and poetry i have great admiration for edgar fawcett there is in his poetry thought beauty and philosophy 
he has the courage of his thought he knows our language the energy of verbs the colour of adjectives he is in the highest sense an artist what do you think of hall caine's recent efforts to bring about a closer union between the stage and pulpit of course i am not certain as to the intentions of mr caine i saw the christian and it did not seem to me that the author was trying to catch the clergy there is certainly nothing in the play calculated to please the pulpit there is a clergyman who is pious and heartless john storm is the only christian and he is crazy when glory accepts him at last you not only feel but you know she has acted the fool the lord in the piece is a dog and the real gentleman is the chap that runs the music hall how the play can please the pulpit i do not see storm's whole career is a failure his followers turn on him like wild beasts his religion is a divine and diabolical dream with him murder is one of the means of salvation mr kane has struck christianity a stinging blow between the eyes he has put two preachers on the stage one a heartless hypocrite and the other a madman certainly i am not prejudiced in favour of christianity and yet i enjoyed the play if mr kane says he is trying to bring the stage and the pulpit together then he is a humorist with a humour of rabelais what do recent exhibitions in this city of scenes from the life of christ indicate with regard to the tendencies of modern art nothing some artists love the sombre the melancholy the hopeless they enjoy painting the bowed form the tear-filled eyes to them grief is a festival there are people who find pleasure in funerals they love to watch the mourners the falling clods make music they love the silence, the heavy odours, the sorrowful hymns, and the preacher's remarks. The feelings of such people do not indicate the general trend of the human mind. Even a poor artist may hope for success if he represents something in which many millions are deeply interested, around which their emotions cling like vines. A man need not be an orator to make a patriotic speech, a speech that flatters his audience. So an artist need not be great in order to satisfy if his subject appeals to the prejudice of those who look at his pictures. I have never seen a good painting of Christ. All the Christ that I have seen lack strength and character. They look weak and despairing. They are all unhealthy. They have the attitude of apology, the sickly smile of non-resistance. I have never seen an heroic, serene, and triumphant Christ. To tell the truth, I never saw a great religious picture. They lack sincerity. All the angels look almost idiotic. In their eyes is no thought, only the innocence of ignorance. I think that art is leaving the celestial, the angelic, and is getting in love with the natural, the human. Troyan put more genius into the representation of cattle than Angelo and Raphael did in angels. No picture has been painted of heaven that is as beautiful as a landscape by Corot. The aim of art is to represent the realities, the highest and noblest, the most beautiful. The Greeks did not try to make men like gods, but they made gods like men, so that great artists of our day go to nature. Is it not strange that, with one exception, the most notable operas written since Wagner are by Italian composers instead of German? For many years German musicians insisted that Wagner was not a composer. They declared that he produced only a succession of discordant noises. I account for this by the fact that the music of Wagner was not German. His countrymen could not understand it. They had to be educated. There was no orchestra in Germany that could really play Tristan and Isolde. Its eloquence, its pathos, its shoreless passion was beyond them. There is no reason to suppose that Germany is to produce another Wagner. Is England expected to give us another Shakespeare? 
End of This Century's Glories Section 11 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Claudia Salto. Interview Title, Divorce. Printed in The Herald, New York, February 1897. First Question. The Herald would like to have you give your ideas on divorce. On last Sunday, in your lecture, you said a few words on the subject, but only a few. Do you think the laws governing divorce ought to be changed? Ingersoll's answer. We obtained our ideas about divorce from the Hebrews, from the New Testament and the Church. In the Old Testament, woman is not considered of much importance. The wife was the property of the husband. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox or his wife. In this commandment, the wife is put on an equality with other property, so under certain conditions the husband could put away his wife but the wife could not put away her husband in the new testament there is little in favour of marriage and really nothing as to the rights of wives christ said nothing in favour of marriage and never married so far as i know none of the apostles had families st paul was opposed to marriage and allowed it only as a choice of evils in those days it was imagined by the christians that the world was about to be purified by fire and that they would be changed into angels the early christians were opposed to marriage and the fathers looked upon a woman as the source of all evil they did not believe in divorces they thought that if people loved each other better than they did God, and got married, they ought to be held to the bargain, no matter what happened. These fathers were, for the most part, ignorant and hateful savages, and had no more idea of right and wrong than wild beasts. The church insisted that marriage was a sacrament, and that God, in some mysterious way, joined husband and wife in marriage, that he was one of the parties to the contract, and that only death could end it. Of course, this supernatural view of marriage is perfectly absurd. If there be a God, there certainly have been marriages he did not approve, and certain it is that God can have no interest in keeping husbands and wives together, who never should have married. Some of the preachers insist that God instituted marriage in the Garden of Eden. We now know that there was no Garden of Eden, and that woman was not made from the first man's rib. Nobody with any real sense believes this now. The institution of marriage was not established by Jehovah, neither was it established by Christ, not any of his apostles. In considering the question of divorce, the supernatural should be discarded. We should take into consideration only the effect upon human beings. The gods should be allowed to take care of themselves. Is it to the interest of a husband and wife to live together after love has perished and when they hate each other? Will this add to their happiness? Should a woman be compelled to remain the wife of a man who hates and abuses her and whom she loathes? Has society any interest in forcing women to live with the men they hate? There is no real marriage without love, and in the marriage state there is no morality without love. A woman who remains the wife of a man whom she despises or does not love corrupts her soul. She becomes degraded, polluted, and feels that her flesh has been soiled. 
under such circumstances a good woman suffers the agonies of moral death it may be said that the woman can leave her husband that she is not compelled to live in the same house or to occupy the same room if she has the right to leave has she the right to get a new house should a woman be punished for having married women do not marry the wrong men on purpose thousands of mistakes are made are these mistakes sacred must they be preserved to please god what good can it do god to keep people married who hate each other what good can it do the community to keep such people together do you consider marriage a contract or a sacrament marriage is the most important contract that human beings can make no matter whether it is called a contract or a sacrament it remains the same a true marriage is a natural concord or agreement of souls a harmony in which discord is not even imagined it is a mingling so perfect that only one seems to exist all other considerations are lost the present seems eternal in this supreme moment there is no shadow or the shadow is as luminous as light when two beings thus love thus united this is the true marriage of soul and soul the idea of contract is lost duty and obligation are instantly changed into desire and joy and two lives like uniting streams flow on as one this is real marriage now if the man turns out to be a wild beast if he destroys the happiness of the wife why should she remain his victim if she wants a divorce she should have it the divorce will not hurt god or the community as a matter of fact it will save a life no man not poisoned by superstition will object to the release of an abused wife in such a case only savages can object to divorce the man who wants courts and legislatures to force a woman to live with him is a monster do you believe that the divorced should be allowed to marry again certainly has the woman whose rights have been outraged no right to build another home must this woman full of kindness affection and health be chained until death releases her is there no future for her must she be an outcast for ever can she never sit by her own hearth with the arms of her children about her neck and by her side a husband who loves and protects her there are no two sides to this question all human beings should be allowed to correct their mistakes if the wife has flagrantly violated the contract of marriage the husband should be given a divorce if the wife wants a divorce if she loathes her husband if she no longer loves him then the divorce should be granted it is immoral for a woman to live as the wife of a man whom she abhors the home should be pure children should be well born their parents should love one another marriages are made by men and women not by society not by the state not by the church not by the gods nothing is moral that does not tend to the well-being of sentient beings the good home is the unit of good government the hearthstone is the cornerstone of civilization society is not interested in the preservation of hateful homes 
it is not to the interest of society that good women should be enslaved or that they should become mothers by husbands whom they hate most of the laws about divorce are absurd or cruel and ought to be repealed End of divorce Section 12 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Claudia Salto. Interview Title, The Sunday Laws of Pittsburgh. Published in The Leader, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, October 27, 1879 first question colonel what do you think of the course the mayor has pursued toward you in attempting to stop your lecture ingersoll's answer i know very little except what i have seen in the morning paper as a general rule laws should be enforced or repealed and so far as i am personally concerned i shall not so much complain of the enforcing of the law against sabbath breaking as of the fact that such a law exists we have fallen heir to these laws they were passed by superstition and the enlightened people of to-day should repeal them ministers should not expect to fill their churches by shutting up other places they can only increase their congregations by improving their sermons they will have more hearers when they say more worth hearing i have no idea that the mayor has any prejudice against me personally and if he only enforces the law i shall have none against him if my lectures were free the ministers might have the right to object but as I charge one dollar admission, and they nothing, they ought certainly be able to compete with me. Don't you think it is the duty of the mayor, as chief executive of the city laws, to enforce the ordinances and pay no attention to what the statutes say? I suppose it to be the duty of the mayor to enforce the ordinance of the city and if the ordinance of the city covers the same ground as the law of the state a conviction under the ordinance would be a bar to prosecution under the state law if the ordinance exempts scientific literary and historical lectures as it says it does will not that exempt you yes all my lectures are historical that is i speak of many things that have happened they are scientific because they are filled with facts and they are literary of course i can conceive of no address that is neither historical nor scientific except sermons they fail to be historical because they treat of things that never happened and they are certainly not scientific as they contain no facts suppose they arrest you what will you do i will examine the law and if convicted will pay the fine unless i think i can reverse the case by appeal of course i would like to see all these foolish laws wiped from the statute books i want the law so that everybody can do just as he pleases on sunday provided he does not interfere with the rights of others i want the christian the jew the deist and the atheist to be exactly equal before the law I would fight for the right of the Christian to worship God in his own way just as quick as I would for the atheist to enjoy music, flowers, and fields. I hope to see the time when even the poor people can hear the music of the finest operas on Sunday. 
one grand opera with all its thrilling tones will do more good in touching and elevating the world than ten thousand sermons on the agonies of hell have you ever been interfered with before in delivering sunday lectures no i postponed a lecture in baltimore at the request of the owners of the theatre because they were afraid some action might be taken that is the only case i have delivered lectures on sunday in the principal cities of the united states in new york boston buffalo chicago san francisco cincinnati and many other places i lectured here last winter it was on sunday and i heard nothing of its being contrary to law i always supposed my lectures were good enough to be delivered on the most sacred days end of the sunday laws of pittsburgh footnote the manager of the theater where colonel ingersoll lectured was fined fifty dollars which colonel ingersoll paid Section 13 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. Interviewed Title, The Oath Question. Printed in the Secular Review, London, England, 1884. First Question. I suppose that your attention has been called to the excitement in England over the oath question, and you have probably wondered that so much should have been made of so little. Yes, I have read a few articles upon the subject, including one by Cardinal Newman. It is wonderful that so many people imagine that there is something miraculous in the oath. They seem to regard it as a kind of verbal fetish, a charm, an open sesame to be pronounced at the door of truth, a spell, a kind of moral thumbscrew, by means of which falsehood itself is compelled to turn informer. The oath has outlived its brother, the wager of battle. Both were born of the idea that God would interfere for the right and for the truth. Trial by fire and by water had the same origin. It was once believed that the man in the wrong could not kill the man in the right, but experience having shown that he usually did, the belief gradually fell into disrepute. So it was once thought that a perjurer could not swallow a piece of sacramental bread, but the fear that made the swallowing difficult, having passed away, the appeal to the coarsenet was abolished. It was found that a brazen or a desperate man could eat himself out of the greatest difficulty with perfect ease, satisfying the law and his own hunger at the same time. The oath is a relic of barbarous theology, of the belief that a personal God interferes in the affairs of men, that some God protects innocence and guards the right. The experience of the world has sadly demonstrated the folly of that belief. The testimony of a witness ought to be believed, not because it is given under the solemnities of an oath, but because it is reasonable. If unreasonable, it ought to be thrown aside. The question ought not to be, has this been sworn to, but is this true? The moment evidence is tested by the standard of reason, the oath becomes a useless ceremony. Let the man who gives false evidence be punished as the law-making power may prescribe. He should be punished because he commits a crime against society, and he should be punished in this world. All honest men will tell the truth if they can, therefore oaths will have no effect upon them. Dishonest men will not tell the truth, unless the truth happens to suit their purpose, therefore oaths will have no effect upon them. We punish them, not for swearing to a lie, but for telling it and we can make the punishment for telling the falsehood just as severe as we wish. If they are to be punished in another world, the probability is that the punishment there will be for having told the falsehood here. After all, a lie is made no worse by an oath, and the truth is made no better. You object, then, to the oath. 
is your objection based on any religious grounds or on any prejudice against the ceremony because of its religious origin or what is your objection i care nothing about the origin of the ceremony the objection to the oath is this it furnishes a falsehood with a letter of credit it supplies the wolf with sheep's clothing and covers the hands of jacob with hair it blows out the light and in the darkness leah is taken for rachel it puts upon each witness a kind of theological gown this gown hides the moral rags of the depraved wretch as well as the virtues of the honest man the oath is a mask that falsehood puts on and for a moment is mistaken for truth it gives to dishonesty the advantage of solemnity the tendency of the oath is to put all testimony on an equality the obscure rascal and the man of sterling character both swear and jurors who attribute a miraculous quality to the oath forget the real difference in the men and give about the same weight to the evidence of each because both were sworn a scoundrel is delighted with the opportunity of going through a ceremony that gives importance and dignity to his story that clothes him for the moment with respectability loans him the appearance of conscience and gives the ring of true coin to the base metal to him the oath is a shield he is in partnership for a moment with god and people who have no confidence in the witness credit the firm of course you know that religionists insist that people are more likely to tell the truth when sworn and that to take away the oath is to destroy the foundation of testimony if the use of the oath is defended on the ground that religious people need a stimulus to tell the truth then i am compelled to say that religious people have been so badly educated that they mistake the nature of the crime they should be taught that to defeat justice by falsehood is the real offence besides fear is not the natural foundation of virtue even with religious people fear cannot always last ananias and sapphira have been dead so long and since their time so many people have sworn falsely without affecting their health that the fear of sudden divine vengeance no longer pales the cheek of the perjurer if the vengeance is not sudden then according to the church the criminal will have plenty of time to repent so that the oath no longer affects even the fearful would it not be better for the church to teach that telling the falsehood is the real crime and that taking the oath neither adds nor takes from its enormity would it not be better to teach that he who does wrong must suffer the consequences whether god forgives him or not he who tries to injure another may or may not succeed but he cannot by any possibility fail to injure himself men should be taught that there is no difference between truth-telling and truth-swearing nothing is more vicious than the idea that any ceremony or form of words hand-lifting or book-kissing can add even in the slightest degree to the perpetual obligation every human being is under to speak the truth the truth plainly told naturally commends itself to the intelligent every fact is a genuine link in the infinite chain and will agree perfectly with every other fact a fact asks to be inspected asks to be understood it needs no oath no ceremony no supernatural aid it is independent of all the gods a falsehood goes in partnership with theology and depends on the partner for success to show how little influence for good has been attributed to the oath it is only necessary to say that for centuries in the christian world no person was allowed to testify who had the slightest pecuniary interest in the result of a suit the expectation of a farthing in this world was supposed to outweigh the fear of god's wrath in the next all the pangs pains and penalties of perdition were considered as nothing when compared with pounds shillings and pence in this world you know that in nearly all deliberative bodies in parliaments and congresses an oath or an affirmation is required to support what is called the constitution and that all officers are required to swear or affirm that they will discharge their duties do these oaths and affirmations in your judgment do any good 
men have sought to make nations and institutions immortal by oaths subjects have sworn to obey kings and kings have sworn to protect subjects and yet the subjects have sometimes beheaded a king and the king has often plundered the subjects the oaths enable them to deceive each other every absurdity in religion and all tyrannical institutions have been patched buttressed and reinforced by oaths and yet the history of the world shows the utter futility of putting in the coffin of an oath the political and religious aspirations of the race revolutions and reformations care little for so help me god oaths have riveted shackles and sanctified abuses people swear to support a constitution and they will keep the oath as long as the constitution supports them in seventeen seventy six the colonists cared nothing for the fact that they had sworn to support the british crown all the oaths to defend the constitution of the united states did not prevent the civil war we have at last learned that states may be kept together for a little time by force permanently only by mutual interest we have found that the delilah of superstition cannot bind with oaths the secular samson why should a member of parliament or of congress swear to maintain the constitution if he is a dishonest man the oath will have no effect if he is an honest patriot it will have no effect in both cases it is equally useless if a member fails to support the constitution the probability is that his constituents will treat him as he does the constitution in this country after all the members of congress have sworn or affirmed to defend the constitution each political party charges the other with a deliberate endeavor to destroy that sacred instrument possibly the political oath was invented to prevent the free and natural development of a nation kings and nobles and priests wished to retain the property they had filched and clutched for that purpose they compelled the real owners to swear that they would support and defend the law under colour of which the theft and robbery had been accomplished so in the church creeds have been protected by oaths priests and laymen solemnly swore that they would under no circumstances resort to reason that they would overcome facts by faith and strike down demonstrations with the sword of the spirit professors of the theological seminary at andover massachusetts swear to defend certain dogmas and to attack others they swear sacredly to keep and guard the ignorance they have with them philosophy leads to perjury and reason is the road to crime while theological professors are not likely to make an intellectual discovery still it is unwise by taking an oath to render that certain which is only improbable if all witnesses sworn to tell the truth did so if all the members of parliament and of congress in taking the oath became intelligent patriotic and honest i should be in favour of retaining the ceremony but we find that men who have taken the same oath advocate opposite ideas and entertain different opinions as to the meaning of the constitutions and laws the oath adds nothing to their intelligence does not even tend to increase their patriotism and certainly does not make the dishonest honest are not persons allowed to testify in the united states whether they believe in future rewards and punishments or not in this country in most of the states witnesses are allowed to testify whether they believe in perdition and paradise or not in some states they are allowed to testify even if they deny the existence of god we have found that religious belief does not compel people to tell the truth and then an utter denial of every christian creed does not even tend to make them dishonest you see a religious belief does not affect the senses justice should not shut any door that leads to truth no one will pretend that because you do not believe in hell your sight is impaired or your hearing dulled or your memory rendered less retentive a witness in a court is called upon to tell what he has seen what he has heard what he remembers not what he believes about gods and devils and hells and heavens a witness substantiates not a faith but a fact 
in order to ascertain whether a witness will tell the truth you might with equal propriety examine him as to his ideas about music painting or architecture as theology a man may have no ear for music and yet remember what he hears he may care nothing about painting and yet is able to tell what he sees so he may deny every creed and yet be able to tell the facts as he remembers them thomas jefferson was wise enough so to frame the constitution of virginia that no person could be deprived of any civil right on account of his religious or irreligious belief through the influence of men like Paine, Franklin, and Jefferson, it was provided in the Federal Constitution that officers elected under its authority could swear or affirm. This was the natural result of the separation of church and state. I see that your presidents and governors issue their proclamations calling on the people to assemble in their churches and offer thanks to God. How does this happen in a government where church and state are not united? Jefferson, when president, refused to issue what is known as the Thanksgiving Proclamation on the ground that the federal government had no right to interfere in religious matters, that the people owed no religious duties to the government that the government derived its powers not from priests or gods but from the people and was responsible alone to the source of its power the truth is the framers of our constitution intended that the government should be secular in the broadest and best sense and yet there are thousands and thousands of religious people in this country who are greatly scandalized because there is no recognition of god in the federal constitution and for several years a great many ministers have been endeavouring to have the constitution amended so as to recognise the existence of god and the divinity of christ a man by the name of pollock was once superintendent of the mint of philadelphia he was almost insane about having god in the constitution failing in that he got the inscription on our money in god we trust as our silver dollar is now in fact worth only eighty-five cents it is claimed that the inscription means that we trust in god for the other fifteen cents there is a constant effort on the part of many christians to have their religion in some way recognized by law proclamations are now issued calling upon the people to give thanks and directing attention to the fact that while god has scourged or neglected other nations he has been remarkably attentive to the wants and wishes of the united states governors of states issue these documents written in a tone of pious insincerity the year may or may not have been prosperous yet the degree of thankfulness called for is always precisely the same a few years ago the governor of iowa issued an exceedingly rhetorical proclamation in which the people were requested to thank god for the unparalleled blessings he had showered upon them a private citizen fearing that the lord might be misled by the official correspondence issued his proclamation in which he recounted with great particularity the hardships of the preceding year he insisted that the weather had been of the poorest quality that the spring came late and the frost early that the people were in debt that the farms were mortgaged that the merchants were bankrupt and that everything was in the worst possible condition he concluded by sincerely hoping that the lord would pay no attention to the proclamation of the governor but would if he had any doubt on the subject come down and examine the state for himself these proclamations have always appeared to me absurdly egotistical why should god treat us any better than he does the rest of his children why should he send pestilence and famine to china and health and plenty to us why give us corn and egypt cholera all these proclamations grow out of egotism and selfishness of ignorance and superstition and are based upon the idea that god is a capricious monster that he loves flattery that he can be coaxed and cajoled the conclusion of the whole matter with me is this for truth in courts we must depend upon the trained intelligence of judges the right of cross-examination the honesty and common sense of jurors and upon an enlightened public opinion as for members of congress we will trust to the wisdom and patriotism not only of the members but of their constituents 
in religion we will give to all the luxury of absolute liberty the alchemist did not succeed in finding any stone the touch of which transmuted baser things to gold and priests have not invented yet an oath with power to force from falsehood's desperate lips the pearl of truth end of the oath question Section 14 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prologue and Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's and Beecher's Responses, read by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. Interview Title, Ingersoll and Beecher, printed in the New York Herald, November 7, 1880. The sensation created by the speech of the Rev. Henry Ward Beecher at the Academy of Music in Brooklyn, when he uttered the brilliant eulogy of Colonel Robert Ingersoll and publicly shook hands with him, has not yet subsided. A portion of the religious world is thoroughly stirred up at what it considers a gross breach of orthodox propriety. This feeling is especially strong among the class of positivists who believe that, quote, an atheist's laugh is a poor exchange for deity offended, end quote. Many believe that Mr. Beecher is at heart in full sympathy and accord with Ingersoll's teachings, but has not courage enough to say so at the sacrifice of his pastoral position. The fact that these two men are at the very head and front of their respective schools of thought makes the matter an important one the denouncement of the doctrine of eternal punishment followed by the scene at the academy has about it an aroma of suggestiveness that might work much harm without an explanation since colonel ingersoll's recent attack upon the personnel of the clergy through the shorter catechism the pulpit has been remarkably silent regarding the great atheist is the keen logic and broad humanity of ingersoll converting the brain and heart of christendom was recently asked did the hand that was stretched out to him on the stage of the academy reach across the chasm which separates orthodoxy from infidelity desiring to answer the last question if possible a herald reporter visited mr beecher and colonel ingersoll to learn their opinion of each other neither of the gentlemen was aware that the other was being interviewed questions to ingersoll on beecher what is your opinion of Mr. Beecher? I regard him as the greatest man in any pulpit of the world. He treated me with a generosity that nothing can exceed. He rose grandly above the prejudices supposed to belong to his class, and acted as only a man could act without a chain upon his brain and only kindness in his heart. I told him that night that I congratulated the world that it had a minister with an intellectual horizon broad enough and a mental sky studded with stars of genius enough to hold all creeds in scorn that shocked the heart of man. I think that Mr. Beecher has liberalized the English-speaking people of the world. I do not think he agrees with me. He holds to many things that I most passionately deny, but in common we believe in the liberty of thought. My principal objections to orthodox religion are two, slavery here and hell hereafter. I do not believe that Mr. Beecher on these points can disagree with me. The real difference between us is, he says God, I say nature. The real agreement between us is, we both say, liberty. What is his forte? He is of a wonderfully poetic temperament. In pursuing any course of thought, his mind is like a stream flowing through the scenery of fairyland. The stream murmurs and laughs, while the banks grow green and the vines blossom. His brain is controlled by his heart. He thinks in pictures. With him, logic means mental melody. The discordant is the absurd. For years he has endeavoured to hide the dungeon of orthodoxy with the ivy of imagination. Now and then he pulls for a moment the leafy curtain aside, and is horrified to see the lizards, snakes, basilisks, and abnormal monsters of the orthodox age. 
and then he utters a great cry the protest of a loving throbbing heart he is a great thinker a marvellous orator and in my judgment greater and grander than any creed of any church besides all this he treated me like a king manhood is his forte and i expect to live and die his friend questions to beecher on ingersoll what is your opinion of colonel ingersoll i do not think there should be any misconception as to my motive for endorsing mr ingersoll i never saw him before that night when i clasped his hand in the presence of an assemblage of citizens yet i regard him as one of the greatest men of this age is his influence upon the world good or otherwise i am an ordained clergyman and believe in revealed religion i am therefore bound to regard all persons who do not believe in revealed religion as in error but on the broad platform of human liberty and progress i was bound to give him the right hand of fellowship i would do it a thousand times over i do not know colonel ingersoll's religious views precisely but i have a general knowledge of them he has the same right to free thought and free speech that i have i am not that kind of a coward who has to kick a man before he shakes hands with him if i did so i would have to kick the methodists roman catholics and all other creeds i will not pitch into any man's religion as an excuse for giving him my hand i admire ingersoll because he is not afraid to speak what he honestly thinks and i am only sorry that he does not think as i do i never heard so much brilliancy and pith put into a two-hour speech as i did on that night i wish my whole congregation had been there to hear it i regret that there are not more men like ingersoll interested in the affairs of the nation i do not wish to be understood as endorsing scepticism in any form end of ingersoll and beecher section fifteen of selected interviews with robert g ingersoll volume one this librivox recording is in the public domain interviewers questions read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana Ingersoll's Responses, read by Claudia Salto. Interview title, District Suffrage, printed in The Capitol, Washington, D.C., December 18, 1881. First question. You have heretofore incidentally expressed yourself on the matter of local suffrage in the District of Columbia. Have you any objections to giving your present views of the question? Ingersoll's answer I am still in favor of suffrage in the district the real trouble is that before any substantial relief can be reached there must be a change in the Constitution of the United States the mere right to elect aldermen and mayors and policemen is of no great importance it is a mistake to take all political power from the citizens of the district americans want to help rule the country the district ought to have at least one representative in congress and should elect one presidential elector the people here should have a voice they should feel that they are part of this country they should have the right to sue in all federal courts precisely as though they were citizens of a state this city ought to have half a million of inhabitants thousands would come here every year from every part of the union were it not for the fact that they do not wish to become political nothings they think that citizenship is worth something and they preserve it by staying away from washington this city is a flag of truce where wounded and dead politicians congregate the mecca of failures the perdition of claimants the purgatory of seekers after place and the heaven only of those who neither want nor do anything 
nothing is manufactured no solid business is done in this city and there never will be until energetic thrifty people wish to make it their home and they will not wish that until the people of the district have something like the rights and political prospects of other citizens it is hard to see why the right to representation should be taken from citizens living in the capital of the nation the believers in free government should believe in a free capital are there any valid reasons why the constitutional limitations to the elective franchise in the district of columbia should not be removed by an amendment to that instrument i cannot imagine one if our government is founded upon a correct principle there can be no objection urged against suffrage in the district that cannot with equal force be urged against every part of the country if freedom is dangerous here it is safe nowhere if a man cannot be trusted in the district he is dangerous in the state we do not trust the place where the man happens to be we trust the man the people of this district cannot remain in their present condition without becoming dishonoured the idea of allowing themselves to be governed by commissioners in whose selection they have no part is monstrous the people here beg implore request ask pray beseech intercede crave urge entreat supplicate memorialize and most humbly petition but they neither vote nor demand they are not allowed to enter the temple of liberty they stay in the lobby or sit on the steps they say paris is france because her electors or citizens control that municipality do you foresee any danger of centralization in the full enfranchisement of the citizens of washington there was a time when the intelligence of france was in paris the country was besotted ignorant catholic paris was alive educated infidel full of new theories of passion and heroism for two hundred years paris was an athlete chained to a corpse the corpse was the rest of france it is different now and the whole country is at last filling with light besides paris has two millions of people it is filled with factories it is not only the intellectual centre but the centre of money and business as well let the corps législatif meet anywhere and paris will continue to be in a certain splendid sense france nothing like that can ever happen here unless you expect washington to outstrip new york philadelphia and chicago if allowing the people of the district of columbia to vote was the only danger to the republic i should be politically the happiest of men i think it somewhat dangerous to deprive even one american citizen of the right to govern himself would you have government clerks and officials appointed to office here given the franchise in the district and should this if given include the women clerks citizenship should be determined here as in the states clerks should not be allowed to vote unless their intention is to make the district their home when i make a government i shall give one vote to each family the unmarried should not be represented except by parents let the family be the unit of representation give each hearthstone a vote how do you regard the opposition of the local clergy and of the bourbon democracy to enfranchising the citizens of the district i did not know that the clergy did oppose it if as you say they do oppose it because they fear it will extend the liquor traffic i think their reason exceedingly stupid 
you cannot make men temperate by shutting up a few of the saloons and leaving others wide open intemperance must be met with other weapons the church ought not to appeal to force what would the clergy of washington think should the miracle of cana be repeated in their day had they been in that country with their present ideas what would they have said after all there is a great deal of philosophy in the following better have the whole world voluntarily drunk than sober on compulsion of course the bourbons object objecting is the business of a bourbon he always objects if he does not understand the question he objects because he does not and if he does understand he objects because he does with him the reason for objecting is the fact that he does what effect if any would the complete franchise to our citizens have upon real estate and business in washington if the people here had representation according to numbers if the avenues to political preferment were open if men here could take part in the real government of the country if they could bring with them all their rights this would be a great and splendid capital we ought to have here a university the best in the world a library second to none and here should be gathered the treasures of american art the federal government has been infinitely economical in the direction of information i hope the time will come when our government will give as much to educate two men as to kill one this completes our interview, District Suffrage. Section 16 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Question, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Response, read by Julia Niedemeyer. Interview Title, Reply to the Christian Endeavorers. Printed in the New York Journal, December 15, 1895. Question. How were you affected by the announcement that the united prayers of the Salvationists and Christian Endeavorers were to be offered for your conversion? Ingersoll's Answer. The announcement did not affect me to any great extent. I take it for granted that the people praying for me are sincere and that they have a real interest in my welfare. Of course, I thank them, one and all. At the same time, I can hardly account for what they did. Certainly, they would not ask God to convert me unless they thought the prayer could be answered. And if their God can convert me, of course he can convert everybody. Then the question arises, why he does not do it why does he let millions go to hell when he can convert them all why did he not convert them all before the flood and take them all to heaven instead of drowning them and sending them all to hell of course these questions can be answered by saying that god's ways are not our ways i am greatly obliged to these people still I feel about the same, so that it would be impossible to get up a striking picture of before and after. It was good-natured on their part to pray for me, and that act alone leads me to believe that there is still hope for them. The trouble with the Christian endeavorers is that they don't give my arguments consideration. If they did, they would agree with me. It seemed curious that they would advise divine wisdom what to do, or that they would ask infinite mercy to treat me with kindness. If there be a God, of course he knows what ought to be done, and will do it without any hints from ignorant human beings. Still, the endeavorers and the salvation people 
may know more about God than I do. For all I know, this God may need a little urging. He may be powerful, but a little slow, intelligent, but sometimes a little drowsy, and it may do good now and then to call his attention to the facts. The prayers did not, so far as I know, do me the least injury or the least good. I was glad to see that the Christians are getting civilized. A few years ago they would have burned me. Now they pray for me. Suppose God should answer the prayers and convert me. How would he bring the conversion about? In the first place he would have to change my brain and give me more credulity. That is, he would be obliged to lessen my reasoning power. Then I would believe not only without evidence, but in spite of evidence. All the miracles would appear perfectly natural. It would then seem as easy to raise the dead as to waken the sleeping. In addition to this, God would so change my mind that I would hold all reason in contempt and put entire confidence in faith. I would then regard science as the enemy of human happiness and ignorance as the soil in which virtues grow. Then I would throw away Darwin and Humboldt and rely on the sermons of orthodox preachers. In other words, I would become a little child and amuse myself with a religious rattle and a Gabriel horn. Then I would rely on a man who has been dead for nearly two thousand years to secure me a seat in paradise. After conversion, it is not pretended that I will be any better, so far as my actions are concerned. No more charitable, no more honest, no more generous. The great difference will be that I will believe more and think less. After all, the converted people do not seem to be better than the sinners. I never heard of a poor wretch clad in rags, limping into a town, and asking for the house of a Christian. I think that I had better remain as I am. I had better follow the light of my reason, be true to myself, express my honest thoughts, and do the little I can for the destruction of superstition, the little I can for the development of the brain, for the increase of intellectual hospitality, and the happiness of my fellow beings, one world at a time. End of Reply to the Christian Endeavorers Section 17 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. Interviewed title, Mr. Beecher, Moses, and the Negro. Published in the Brooklyn Eagle, January 31st, 1881. First question. Mr. Beecher is here. Have you seen him? Ingersoll's answer. No, I did not meet Mr. Beecher. Neither did I hear him lecture. The fact is that long ago I made up my mind that under no circumstances would I attend any lecture or other entertainment given at Lincoln Hall. First, because the hall has been denied me, and secondly, because I regard it as extremely unsafe. The hall is up several stories from the ground and a case of the slightest panic, in my judgment, many lives would be lost. Had it not been for this, and for the fact that the persons owning it imagined that because they had control, the brick and mortar had some kind of holy and sacred quality, and that this holiness is of such a wonderful character that it would not be proper for a man in that hall to tell his honest thoughts, I would have heard him. Then I assume that you and Mr. Beecher have made up. There is nothing to be made up for, so far as I know. Mr. Beecher has treated me very well, and I believe a little too well, for his own peace of mind. 
i have been informed that some members of plymouth church felt exceedingly hurt that their pastor should so far forget himself as to extend the right hand of fellowship to one who differs from him upon what they consider very essential points in theology you see i have denied with all my might a great many times the infamous doctrine of eternal punishment I have also had the temerity to suggest that I did not believe that a being of infinite justice and mercy was the author of all that I find in the Old Testament. As, for instance, I have insisted that God never commanded anybody to butcher women or to cut the throats of prattling babes. These orthodox gentlemen have rushed to the rescue of Jehovah by insisting that he did all these horrible things. I have also maintained that God never sanctioned or upheld human slavery, that he never would make one child to own and beat another. I have also expressed some doubts as to whether this same God ever established the institution of polygamy. I have insisted that the institution is simply infamous, that it destroys the idea of home, that it turns to ashes the most sacred words in our language and leaves the world a kind of den in which crawl the serpents of selfishness and lust i have been informed that after mr beecher had treated me kindly a few members of his congregation objected and really felt ashamed that he had so forgotten himself after that mr beecher saw fit to give his ideas of the position i had taken in this he was not exceedingly kind nor was his justice very conspicuous but I cared nothing about that, not the least. As I have said before, whenever Mr. Beecher says a good thing, I give him credit. Whenever he does an unfair or unjust thing, I charge it to the account of his religion. I have insisted, and I still insist, that Mr. Beecher is far better than his creed. I do not believe that he believes in the doctrine of eternal punishment, neither do I believe that he believes in the literal truth of the Scriptures and after all if the bible is not true it is hardly worth while to insist upon its inspiration an inspired lie is not better than an uninspired one if the bible is true it does not need to be inspired if it is not true inspiration does not help it so that after all it is simply a question of fact is it true i believe mr beecher stated that one of my grievous faults was that i picked out the bad things in the bible how an infinitely good and wise God came to put bad things in his book, Mr. Beecher does not explain. I have insisted that the Bible is not inspired, and, in order to prove that, have pointed out such passages as I deemed unworthy to have been written, even by a civilized man or a savage. I certainly would not endeavor to prove that the Bible is uninspired by picking out its best passages. I admit that there are many good things in the Bible. The fact that there are good things in it does not prove its inspiration, because there are thousands of other books containing good things, and yet no one claims they are inspired. Shakespeare's works contain a thousand times more good things than the Bible, but no one claims he was an inspired man. It is also true that there are many bad things in Shakespeare, many passages which I wish he had never written but i can excuse shakespeare because he did not rise absolutely above his time that is to say he was a man that is to say he was imperfect if anybody claimed now that shakespeare was actually inspired that claim would be answered by pointing to certain weak or bad or vulgar passages in his works but every Christian will say that it is a certain kind of blasphemy to impute vulgarity or weakness to God, as they are all obliged to defend the weak, the bad, and the vulgar, so long as they insist upon the inspiration of the Bible. Now, I pursued the same course with the Bible that Mr. Beecher has pursued with me. Why did he want to pick out my bad things? Is it possible that he is a kind of vulture that sees only the carrion of another? After all, has he not pursued the same method with me that he blames me for pursuing in regard to the Bible? Of course he must pursue that method. He could not object to me and then point out passages that were not objectionable. 
if he found fault he had to find faults in order to sustain his ground that is exactly what i have done with scriptures nothing more and nothing less the reason i have thrown away the bible is that in many places it is harsh cruel unjust coarse vulgar atrocious infamous at the same time i admit that it contains many passages of an excellent and splendid character many good things wise sayings and many excellent and just laws but i would like to ask this suppose there were no passages in the bible except those upholding slavery polygamy and wars of extermination would anybody then claim that it was the word of god i would like to ask if there is a christian in the world who would not be overjoyed to find that every one of these passages was an interpolation i would also like to ask mr beecher if he would not be greatly gratified to find that after god had written the bible the devil got hold of it and interpolated all these passages about slavery polygamy the slaughter of women and babes and the doctrine of eternal punishment suppose as a matter of fact the devil did get hold of it what part of the bible would mr beecher pick out as having been written by the devil and if he picks out these passages could not the devil answer him by saying quote, you mr beecher are like a vulture a kind of buzzard flying through the tainted air of inspiration and pouncing down upon the carrion why do you not fly like a dove and why do you not have the innocent ignorance of the dove so that you could light upon a carcass and imagine that you were surrounded by the perfume of violets Unquote. the fact is that good things in a book do not prove that it is inspired but the presence of bad things does prove that it is not what was the real difficulty between you and moses colonel a man who has been dead for thousands of years we never had any difficulty i have always taken pains to say that moses had nothing to do with the pentateuch those books in my judgment were written several centuries after moses had become dust in his unknown sepulchre no doubt Moses was quite a man in this day, if he ever existed at all. Some people say that Moses is exactly the same as lawgiver, that is to say, as legislator, that is to say, as Congress. Imagine somebody in the future as regarding the Congress of the United States as one person. And then imagine that somebody endeavouring to prove that Congress was always consistent. But whether Moses lived or not makes but little difference to me. I presume he filled the place and did the work that he was compelled to do, and although, according to the account, God had much to say to him with regard to the making of altars, tongs, snuffers, and candlesticks, there is much left for nature still to tell. Thinking of Moses as a man, admitting that he was above his fellows, that he was in his day and generation a leader, and in a certain narrow sense a patriot, that he was the founder of the Jewish people, that he found them barbarians and endeavoured to control them by thunder and lightning, and found it necessary to pretend that he was in partnership with the power governing the universe, that he took advantage of their ignorance and fear, just as politicians do now, and as theologians always will. Still, I see no evidence that the man Moses was any nearer to God than his descendants who are still warring against the philistines in every civilized part of the globe moses was a believer in slavery in polygamy in wars of extermination in religious persecution and intolerance and in almost everything that is now regarded with loathing contempt and scorn the jehovah of whom he speaks violated or commands the violation of at least nine of the ten commandments he gave there is one thing, however, that can be said of Moses, that cannot be said of any person who now insists that he was inspired, and that is, he was in advance of his time. What do you think of the Buckner Bill for the colonization of the Negroes in Mexico? Where does Mr. Buckner propose to colonize the white people? 
and what right has he to propose the colonization of six millions of people should we not have other bills to colonize the germans the swedes the irish and then maybe another bill to drive the chinese into the sea where do we get the right to say that the negroes must emigrate all such schemes will in my judgment prove utterly futile perhaps the history of the world does not give an instance of the emigration of six millions of people notwithstanding the treatment that ireland has received from england which may be designated as a crime of three hundred years the irish still love ireland all the despotism in the world will never crush out of the irish heart the love of home the adoration of the old sod the negroes of the south have certainly suffered enough to drive them into other countries but after all they prefer to stay where they were born they prefer to live where their ancestors were slaves where fathers and mothers were sold and whipped i don't believe it will be possible to induce a majority of them to leave that land of course thousands may leave and in process of time millions may go but i don't believe emigration will ever equal their natural increase as the whites of the south become civilized the reason for going will be less and less i see no reason why the white and black men cannot live together in the same land under the same flag the beauty of liberty is you cannot have it unless you give it away and the more you give away the more you have i know that my liberty is secure only because others are free i am perfectly willing to live in a country with such men as frederick douglas and senator bruce i have always preferred a good clever black man to a mean white man and i am of the opinion that i shall continue in that preference now if we could only have a colonization bill that would get rid of all the rowdies all the rascals and hypocrites i would like to see it carried out though some people might insist that it would amount to a repudiation of the national debt and that hardly enough would be left to pay the interest no talk as we will the colored people helped to save this nation they have been at all times and in all places the friends of our flag a flag that never really protected them and for my part i am willing that they should stand forever beneath that flag the equal in rights of all other people politically if any black men are to be sent away i want it understood that each one is to be accompanied by a democrat so that the balance of power especially in new york will not be disturbed i notice that leading republican newspapers are advising general garfield to cut loose from the machine in politics what do you regard as the machine all defeated candidates regard the persons who defeated them as constituting a machine and always imagine that there is some wicked conspiracy at the bottom of the machine some of the recent reformers regard the people who take part in the early stages of a political campaign who attend caucuses and primaries who speak of politics to their neighbors as members and parts of the machine and regard only those as good and reliable american citizens who take no part whatever simply reserving the right to grumble after the work has been done by others not much can be accomplished in politics without an organization and the moment an organization is formed and you might say just a little before leading spirits will be developed certain men will take the lead and the weaker men will in a short time unless they get all the loaves and fishes denounce the whole thing as a machine and to show how thoroughly and honestly they detest the machine in politics will endeavor to organize a little machine themselves general garfield has been in politics for many years he knows the principal men in both parties he knows the men who have not only done something but who are capable of doing something and such men will not in my opinion be neglected i do not believe that general garfield will do any act calculated to divide the republican party no thoroughly great man carries personal prejudice into the administration of public affairs of course thousands of people will be prophesying that this man is to be snubbed and another to be paid 
but in my judgment after the fourth of march most people will say that general garfield has used his power wisely and that he has neither sought nor shunned men simply because he wished to pay debts either of love or hatred this ends our interview mr beecher moses and the negro Section 18 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Julia Niedermeyer. Interview Title, Sunday, A Day of Pleasure. Published in the New York Times, July 21, 1893 first question what do you think of the religious spirit that seeks to regulate by legislation the manner in which the people of this country shall spend their sundays ingersoll's answer the church is not willing to stand alone not willing to base its influence on reason and on the character of its members it seeks the aid of the state the cross is in partnership with the sword people should spend sundays as they do other days that is to say as they please no one has the right to do anything on monday that interferes with the rights of his neighbors and everyone has the right to do anything he pleases on sunday that does not interfere with the rights of his neighbors sunday is a day of rest not of religion we are under obligation to do right on all days nothing can be more absurd than the idea that any particular space of time is sacred everything in nature goes on the same on sunday as on other days and if beyond nature there be a god then god works on sunday as he does on all other days there is no rest in nature there is perpetual activity in every possible direction the old idea that God made the world and then rested is idiotic. There were two reasons given to the Hebrews for keeping the Sabbath. One, because Jehovah rested on that day. The other, because the Hebrews were brought out of Egypt. The first reason, we know, is false. And the second reason is good only for the Hebrews. According to the Bible, Sunday or rather the sabbath was not for the world but for the hebrews and the hebrews alone our sunday is pagan and is the day of the sun as monday is the day of the moon all our day names are pagan i am opposed to all sunday legislation why should sunday be observed otherwise than as a day of recreation sunday is a day of recreation or should be a day for the laboring man to rest a day to visit museums and libraries a day to look at pictures a day to get acquainted with your wife and children a day for poetry and art a day on which to read old letters and to meet friends a day to cultivate the amenities of life a day for those who live in tenements to feel the soft grass beneath their feet in short sunday should be a day of joy the church endeavors to fill it with gloom and sadness with stupid sermons and dyspeptic theology nothing could be more cowardly than the effort to compel the observance of the sabbath by law we of america have outgrown the childishness of this last century we laugh at the superstitions of our fathers we have made up our minds to be as happy as we can be knowing that the way to be happy is to make others so that the time to be happy is now whether that now is sunday or any other day in the week under the federal constitution guaranteeing civil and religious liberty are the so-called blue laws constitutional no they are not but the probability is that the supreme courts of most of the states would decide the other way and yet 
all these laws are clearly contrary to the spirit of the federal constitution and the constitutions of most of the states i hope to live until all these foolish laws are repealed and until we are in the highest and noblest sense a free people and by free i mean each having the right to do anything that does not interfere with the rights or with the happiness of another i want to see the time when we live for this world and when all shall endeavour to increase by education by reason and by persuasion the sum of human happiness and this ends our interview sunday a day of pleasure Section 19 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. Interview Title, Hades, Delaware, and Free Thought. Printed in the Brooklyn Eagle, March 19th, 1881 first question now that a lull has come in politics i thought i would come and see what's going on in the religious world well from what i learn there has not been much going on during the last year there are five hundred and twenty six congressional churches in massachusetts and two hundred of these churches have not received a new member for an entire year and the others have scarcely held their own in illinois there are four hundred and eighty three presbyterian churches and they have now fewer members than they had in eighteen seventy nine and of the four hundred and eighty three one hundred and eighty three have not received a single new member for twelve months a report has been made under the auspices of the pan presbyterian council to the effect that there are in the whole world about three millions of presbyterians this is about one-fifth of one per cent of the inhabitants of the world the probability is that of the three million nominal presbyterians not more than two or three hundred thousand actually believe the doctrine and of the two or three hundred thousand not more than five or six hundred have any true conception of what the doctrine is as the presbyterian church has only been able to induce one-fifth of one per cent of the people to even call themselves presbyterians about how long will it take at this rate to convert mankind the fact is there seems to be a general lull along the entire line and just at present very little is being done by the orthodox people to keep their fellow citizens out of hell do you really think that the orthodox people now believe in the old doctrine of eternal punishment and that they really think there is a kind of hell that our ancestors so carefully described i'm afraid that the old idea is dying out and that many christians are slowly giving up the consolations naturally springing from the old belief another terrible blow to the old infamy is the fact that in the revised new testament the word hades has been substituted as nobody knows exactly what hades means it will not be quite so easy to frighten people at revivals by threatening them with something that they don't clearly understand after this when the impassioned orator cries out that all the unconverted will be sent to hades the poor sinners instead of getting frightened will begin to ask each other what and where that is it will take many years of preaching to clothe that word in all the terrors and horrors pains and penalties and pangs of hell hades is a compromise it is a concession to the philosophy of our day it is a graceful acknowledgment to the growing spirit of investigation that hell after all is a barbaric mistake hades is the death of revivals it cannot be used in song it won't rhyme with anything with the same force that hell does it is altogether more shadowy than hot it is not associated with brimstone and flame it sounds somewhat indistinct somewhat lonesome a little desolate but not altogether uncomfortable for revival purposes hades is simply useless and few conversions will be made in the old way under the revised testament
do you really think that the church is losing ground i'm not as you probably know connected with any orthodox organization and consequently have to rely upon them for my information if they can be believed the church is certainly in an extremely bad condition i find that the reverend dr kyler only a few days ago speaking of the religious condition of brooklyn and brooklyn you know has been called the city of churches states that the great mass of that christian city was out of christ and that more professing christians went to the theatre than to the prayer meeting this certainly from their standpoint is a most terrible declaration brooklyn you know is one of the great religious centres of the world a city in which nearly all the people are engaged either in delivering or in hearing sermons a city filled with the editors of religious periodicals a city of prayer and praise and yet while prayer meetings are free the theatres with the free list entirely suspended catch more christians than the churches and this happens while all the pulpits thunder against the stage and the stage remains silent as to the pulpit at the same meeting in which the reverend dr kyler made his astounding statements the reverend mr pentecost was the bearer of the happy news that four out of five persons living in the city of brooklyn were going down to hell with no god and with no hope if he had read the revised testament he would have said hades and the effect of the statement would have been entirely lost if four-fifths of the people of that great city are destined to eternal pain certainly we cannot depend upon churches for the salvation of the world at the meeting of the brooklyn pastors they were in doubt as to whether they should depend upon further meetings or upon a day of fasting and prayer for the purpose of converting the city in my judgment it would be much better to devise ways and means to keep a good many people from fasting in brooklyn if they had more meat they could get along with less meeting if fasting would save a city there are always plenty of hungry folks even in that christian town the real trouble with the church of today is that it is behind the intelligence of the people its doctrines no longer satisfy the brains of the nineteenth century and if the church proposes to hold its power it must lose its superstitions the day of revivals is gone only the ignorant and unthinking can hereafter be impressed by hearing the orthodox creed fear has in it no reformatory power and the more intelligent the world grows the more despicable and contemptible the doctrine of eternal misery will become the tendency of the age is toward intellectual liberty toward personal investigation authority is no longer taken for truth people are beginning to find that all the great and good are not dead that some good people are alive and that the demonstrations of today are fully equal to the mistaken theories of the past how are you getting along with delaware first rate you know i've been wondering where come guess came from and at last i have made the discovery i was told the other day by a gentleman from delaware that many years ago colonel hazlitt died that colonel hazlitt was an old revolutionary officer and that when they were digging his grave they dug up comagus back of that no one knows anything of his history the only thing they know about him certainly is that he has never changed one of his views since he was found and that he never will i am inclined to think however that he lives in a community congenial to him for instance i saw in a paper the other day that within a radius of thirty miles around georgetown delaware there are about two hundred orphan and friendless children these children it seems were indentured to delaware farmers by the managers of orphan asylums and other public institutions in and about philadelphia it is stated in the paper that quote, many of these farmers are rough taskmasters and if a boy fails to perform the work of an adult he is almost certain to be cruelly treated half starved and in the coldest weather wretchedly clad if he does the work his life is not likely to be much happier for as a rule he will receive more kicks than candy the result in either case is almost certain to be wrecked constitutions dwarfed bodies rounded shoulders 
and limbs crippled or rendered useless by frost or rheumatism. The principal diet of these boys is corn pone. A few days ago, Constable W. H. Johnston went to the house of Reuben Taylor, and on entering the sitting room, his attention was attracted by the moans of its only occupant, a little coloured boy. It was lying on the hearth in front of the fireplace. The boy's head was covered with ashes from the fire, and he did not pay the slightest attention to the visitor, until Johnston asked what made him cry. Then the little fellow sat up, and drawing an old rag off his foot, said, Look there. The sight that met Johnston's eye was horrible beyond description. The poor boy's feet were so horribly frozen that the flesh dropped off the toes until the bones protruded. The flesh on the sides, bottoms, and tops of his feet was swollen until the skin cracked in many places, and the inflamed flesh was sloughing off in great flakes. The frost-bitten flesh extended to his knees, the joints of which were terribly inflamed. The right one had already begun separating. This poor little black boy, covered with nothing but a cotton shirt, drilling pants, a pair of nearly worn-out brogans, and a battered old hat, on the morning of December 30th, the coldest day of the season, when the mercury was seventeen degrees below zero. In the face of a driving snowstorm, was sent half a mile from home to protect his master's unshucked corn from the depredations of marauding cows and crows. He remained standing around in the snow until four o'clock, then he drove the cows home, received a piece of cold corn pone, and was sent out in the snow again to chop stove wood till dark. Having no bed, he slept that night in front of the fireplace, with his frozen feet buried in the ashes. Dr. C. H. Richards found it necessary to cut off the boy's feet as far back as the ankle and the instep. Unquote. This was but one case in several. Personally, I have no doubt that Mr. Reuben Taylor entirely agrees with Chief Justice Comagus on the great question of blasphemy, and probably nothing would so gratify Mr. Reuben Taylor as to see some man in a Delaware jail for the crime of having expressed an honest thought. No wonder that in the state of Delaware the Christ of intellectual liberty has been crucified between the pillory and the whipping post. Of course I know that there are thousands of most excellent people in that state, people who believe in intellectual liberty, and who only need a little help, and I'm doing what I can in that direction, to repeal the laws that now disgrace the statute book of that little commonwealth. I have seen many people from that state lately who really wish that Colonel Hazlitt had never died. What has the press generally said with regard to the action of Judge Cummigus? Do they, so far as you know, justify his charge? A great many papers, having articles upon the subject, have been sent to me. A few of the religious papers seem to think that the judge did the best he knew, and there is one secular paper, called the Evening News, published at Chester, Pennsylvania, that thinks, quote, that the rebuke from so high a source of authority will have a most excellent effect and will check religious blasphemers from parading their immoral creeds before the people." Unquote. The editor of this paper should at once emigrate to the state of Delaware, where he properly belongs. He is either a native of Delaware, or most of his subscribers are citizens of that country, or it may be that he is a lineal descendant of some Hessian, who deserted during the Revolutionary War. Most of the newspapers in the United States are advocates of mental freedom. Probably nothing on earth has been so potent for good as an untrammeled, fearless press. Among the papers of importance there is not a solitary exception. No leading journal in the United States can be found upon the side of intellectual slavery. Of course, a few rural sheets edited by gentlemen, as Mr. Greeley, would say, quote, whom God, in his inscrutable wisdom, had allowed to exist, unquote. may be found upon the other side, and may be small enough, weak enough, and mean enough to pander to the lowest and basest prejudices of their most ignorant subscribers. These editors disgrace their profession, 
and exert about the same influence upon the heads as upon the pockets of their subscribers that is to say they get little and give less do you not think after all the people who are in favor of having you arrested for blasphemy are acting in accordance with the real spirit of the old and new testaments of course they act in exact accordance with many of the commands in the old testament and in accordance with several passages in the new at the same time it may be said that they violate passages in both if the old testament is true and if it is the inspired word of god of course an infidel ought not be allowed to live and if the new testament is true an unbeliever should not be permitted to speak there are many passages though in the new testament that should protect even an infidel among them is this quote, do unto others as ye would that others should do unto you unquote. but this is a passage that has probably had as little effect upon the church as any other in the bible so far as I am concerned, I am willing to adopt that passage, and I am willing to extend to every other human being every right that I claim for myself. If the churches would act upon this principle, if they would say every soul, every mind, may think and investigate for itself, and around all, and over all, shall be thrown the sacred shield of liberty, I should be on their side. How do you stand with the clergyman? And what is their opinion of you and your views? Most of them envy me, envy my independence, envy my success, think that I ought to starve, that the people should not hear me, say that I do what I do for money, for popularity, that I am actuated by hatred of all that is good and tender and holy in human nature think that i wish to tear down the churches destroy all morality and goodness and usher in the reign of crime and chaos they know that shepherds are unnecessary in the absence of wolves and it is to their interest to convince their sheep that they the sheep need protection this they are willing to give them for half the wool no doubt most of these ministers are honest and are doing what they consider their duty be this as it may they feel the power slipping from their hands they know that the idea is slowly growing that they are not absolutely necessary for the protection of society they know that the intellectual world cares little for what they say and that the great tide of human progress flows on careless of their help or hindrance so long as they insist upon the inspiration of the bible they are compelled to take the ground that slavery was once a divine institution they are forced to defend cruelties that would shock the heart of a savage and besides they are bound to teach the eternal horror of everlasting punishment they poison the minds of children they deform the brain and pollute the imagination by teaching the frightful and infamous dogma of endless misery even the laws of delaware shock the enlightened public of today in that state they simply fine and imprison a man for expressing his honest thoughts and yet if the churches are right god will damn a man forever for the same offence the brain and heart of our time cannot be satisfied with the ancient creeds the bible must be revised again most of the creeds must be blotted out humanity must take the place of theology intellectual liberty must stand in every pulpit there must be freedom in all the pews and every human soul must have the right to express its honest thought and that concludes the interview hades delaware and free thought section twenty of selected interviews with robert g ingersoll volume one this librivox recording is in the public domain prologue and interviewers questions read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana ingersoll's responses read by julia niedermeyer interview title a reply to the reverend mr lansing published in the sunday union new haven connecticut april tenth eighteen eighty one reverend isaac j lansing of meriden connecticut 
recently denounced colonel robert g ingersoll from the pulpit of the meriden methodist church and had the opera house closed against him this led a union reporter to show colonel ingersoll what mr lansing had said and to interrogate him with the following result first question did you favor the sending of obscene matter through the mails as alleged by the reverend mr lansing ingersoll's answer of course not and no honest man ever thought that i did this charge is too malicious and silly to be answered mr lansing knows better he has made this charge many times and he will make it again is it a fact that there are thousands of clergymen in the country whom you would fear to meet in fair debate no the fact is i would like to meet them all in one the pulpit is not burdened with genius there are a few great men engaged in preaching but they are not orthodox i cannot conceive that a free thinker has anything to fear from the pulpit except misrepresentation of course there are thousands of ministers too small to discuss with ministers who stand for nothing in the church and with such clergymen i cannot afford to discuss anything if the presbyterians or the congregationalists or the methodists would select some man and endorse him as their champion i would like to meet him in debate such a man i will pay to discuss with me i will give him most excellent wages and pay all the expenses at the discussion besides there is but one safe course for the ministers they must assert they must declare they must swear to it and stick to it but they must not try to reason you have never seen reverend mr lansing to the people of meriden and thereabouts he is well known judging from what has been told you of his utterances and actions what kind of a man would you take him to be i would take him to be a christian he talks like one and he acts like one if christianity is right lansing is right if salvation depends upon belief and if unbelievers are to be eternally damned then an infidel has no right to speak he should not be allowed to murder the souls of his fellow men lansing does the best he knows how he thinks that god hates an unbeliever and he tries to act like god lansing knows that he must have the right to slander a man whom god is to eternally damn mr lansing speaks of you as a wolf coming with fangs sharpened by three hundred dollars a night to tear the lambs of his flock what do you say to that all i have to say is that i often get three times that amount and sometimes much more i guess his lambs can take care of themselves i am not very fond of mutton anyway such talk mr lansing ought to be ashamed of the idea that he is a shepherd that he is on guard is simply preposterous he has few sheep in his congregation that know as little on the wolf question as he does he ought to know that his sheep support him his sheep protect him and without the sheep poor lansing would be devoured by the wolves himself shall you sue the opera house management for breach of contract i guess not but i may pay lansing something for advertising my lecture i suppose mr wilcox who controls the opera house did what he thought was right i hear he is a good man he probably got a little frightened and began to think about the day of judgment he could not help it and i cannot help laughing at him those in meriden who most strongly oppose you are radical republicans is it not a fact that you possess the confidence and friendship of some of the most respected leaders of that party i think that all the respectable ones are friends of mine i am a republican because i believe in the liberty of the body and i am an infidel because i believe in the liberty of the mind there is no need of freeing cages let us free the birds if mr lansing knew me 
he would be a great friend. He would probably annoy me by the frequency and length of his visits. During the recent presidential campaign, did any clergyman denounce you for your teachings that you are aware of? Some did, but they would not if they had been running for office on the Republican ticket. What is most needed in our public men? Hearts and brains. Would people be any more moral solely because of a disbelief in orthodox teaching and in the Bible as an inspired book, in your opinion? Yes. If a man really believes that God once upheld slavery, that he commanded soldiers to kill women and babes, that he believed in polygamy, that he persecuted for opinion's sake, that he will punish forever, and that he hates an unbeliever, the effect in my judgment will be bad. It always has been bad. This belief built the dungeons of the Inquisition. This belief made the Puritan murder the Quaker. And this belief has raised the devil with Mr. Lansing. Do you believe there will ever be a millennium? And if so, how will it come about? It will probably start in Meriden, as I have been informed that Lansing is going to leave. Is there anything else bearing upon the question at issue, or that would make good reading that I have forgotten, that you would like to say? Yes. Goodbye. And that concludes this interview. A reply to the Reverend Mr. Lansing. Section 21 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. Interview Title, Free Trade and Christianity. Printed in the Denver Republican, Denver, Colorado, January 17th, 1884. First question. Who will be the Republican nominee for president? The correct answer to this question would make so many men unhappy that I have concluded not to give it. Has not the democracy injured itself irretrievably by permitting the free trade element to rule it? I do not think that the Democratic Party weakened itself by electing Carlyle, Speaker. I think him an excellent man, an exceedingly candid man, and one who will do what he believes ought to be done. I have a very high opinion of Mr. Carlyle. I do not suppose any party in this country is really for free trade. I find that all writers upon the subject, no matter which side they are on, are on that side with certain exceptions. Adam Smith was in favour of free trade with a few exceptions, and those exceptions were in matters where he thought it was for England's interest not to have free trade. The same thing may be said of all writers. So far as I can see, the free traders have all the arguments, and the protectionists all the facts. The free trade theories are splendid, but they will not work. The results are disastrous. We find by actual experiment that it is better to protect home industries. It was once said that protection created nothing but monopoly. The argument was that way, but the facts are not. Take for instance steel rails. When we bought them off England we paid $125 a ton. I believe there was a tariff of 28 or $29 a ton. And yet, in spite of all the arguments going to show that protection would simply increase prices in America, would simply enrich the capitalists and impoverish the consumer, steel rails are now produced, I believe, right here in Colorado, for $42 a tonne. After all, it is a question of labour, a question of prices that shall be paid the labouring man, a question of what the labouring man shall eat whether he shall eat meat or soup made from the bones. Very few people take into consideration the value of raw material and the value of labour. Take, for instance, your ton of steel rails worth $42. The iron in the earth is not worth 25 cents. 
the coal in the earth and the lime in the ledge together are not worth twenty-five cents now then of the forty-two dollars forty-one and a half is labor there is not two dollars worth of raw material in a locomotive worth fifteen thousand dollars by raw material i mean the material in the earth there is not in the works of a watch which will sell for fifteen dollars raw material of the value of one half cent all the rest is labor a ship a man of war that costs one million dollars the raw material in the earth is not worth in my judgment one thousand dollars all the rest is labor if there is any way to protect american labor i am in favor of it if the present tariff does not do it then i am in favor of changing to one that will if the democratic party takes a stand for free trade or anything like it they will need protection they will need protection at the polls that is to say they will meet only with defeat and disaster what should be done with the surplus revenue my answer to that is reduce internal revenue taxation until the present surplus is exhausted and then endeavor so to arrange your tariff that you will not produce more than you need i think the easiest question to grapple with on this earth is a surplus of money i do not believe in distributing it among the states i do not think there could be a better certificate of the prosperity of our country than the fact that we are troubled with a surplus revenue that we have the machinery for collecting taxes in such perfect order so ingeniously contrived that it cannot be stopped that it goes right on collecting money whether we want it or not and the wonderful thing about it is that nobody complains if nothing else can be done with the surplus revenue probably we had better pay some of our debts i would suggest as a last resort to pay a few honest claims are you getting nearer to or farther away from god christianity and the bible in the first place as mr locke so often remarked we will define our terms if by the word god is meant a person a being who existed before the creation of the universe and who controls all that is except himself i do not believe in such a being but if by the word god is meant all that is that is to say the universe including every atom and every star then i am a believer i suppose the word that would nearest describe me is pantheist i cannot believe that a being existed from eternity and who finally created this universe after having wasted an eternity in idleness but upon this subject i know just as little as anybody ever did or ever will and in my judgment just as much my intellectual horizon is somewhat limited and to tell you the truth this is the only world that i was ever in i am what might be called a representative of a rural district and as a matter of fact i know very little about the district i believe it was confucius who said how should i know anything about another world when i know so little of this the greatest intellects of the world have endeavored to find words to express their conception of god of the first cause or of the science of being but they have never succeeded i find in the old confession of faith in the old catechism for instance this description that god is a being without body parts or passions i think it would trouble anybody to find a better definition of nothing that describes a vacuum that is to say that describes the absence of everything i find that theology is a subject that only the most ignorant are certain about and that the more a man thinks the less he knows from the bible god i do not know that i am going further and further away i have been about as far as a man could get for many years i do not believe in the god of the old testament now as to the next branch of your question christianity the question arises what is christianity i have no objection to the morality taught as a part of christianity no objection to its charity its forgiveness its kindness no objection to its hope for this world and another 
not the slightest but all these things do not make christianity mohammed taught certain doctrines that are good but the good in the teachings of mohammed is not mohammedism when i speak of christianity i speak of that which is distinctly christian for instance the idea that the infinite god was born in palestine learned the carpenter's trade disputed with the parsons of his time excited the wrath of the theological bigots and was finally crucified that afterward he was raised from the dead and that if anybody believes this he will be saved and if he fails to believe it he will be lost in other words that which is distinctly christian in the christian system is its supernaturalism its miracles its absurdity truth does not need to go into partnership with the supernatural what christ said is worth the reason it contains if a man raises the dead and then says twice two are five that changes no rule in mathematics if a multiplication table was divinely inspired that does no good the question is is it correct so I think that in the world of morals we must prove that a thing is right or wrong by experience, by analogy, not by miracles. There is no fact in physical science that can be supernaturally demonstrated. Neither is there any fact in the moral world that could be substantiated by miracles. Now then, keeping in mind that by Christianity I mean the supernatural in that system, of course i'm just as far away from it as i can get for the man christ i have respect he was an infidel in his day and the ministers of his day cried out blasphemy as they have been crying ever since against every person who has suggested a new thought or shown the worthlessness of an old one now as to the third part of the question the bible people say that the bible is inspired well what does inspiration mean did God write it? No, but the men who did write it were guided by the Holy Spirit. Very well. Did they write exactly what the Holy Spirit wanted them to write? Well, religious people say yes. At the same time, they admit that the gentlemen who were collecting or taking down in shorthand what was said had to use their own words. Now, we all know that the same words do not have the same meaning to all people. It is impossible to convey the same thoughts to all minds by the same language, and it is for that reason that the Bible has produced so many sects, not only disagreeing with each other, but disagreeing among themselves. We find, then, that it is utterly impossible for God, admitting that there is one, to convey the same thoughts in human language to all people. No two persons understand the same language alike. A man's understanding depends upon his experience, upon his capacity, upon the particular bent of his mind, in fact, upon the countless influences that have made him what he is. Everything in nature tells everyone who sees it a story, but that story depends upon the capacity of the one to whom it is told. The sea says one thing to the ordinary man, and another thing to Shakespeare. The stars have not the same language for all people. The consequence is that no book can tell the same story to any two persons. The Jewish scriptures are like other books, written by different men in different ages of the world, hundreds of years apart, filled with contradictions. They embody, I presume, fairly enough, the wisdom and ignorance, the reason and prejudice, of the times in which they were written. They are worth the good that is in them, and the question is whether we will take the good and throw the bad away. There are good laws and bad laws. There are wise and foolish sayings. There are gentle and cruel passages, and you can find a text to suit almost any frame of mind, whether you wish to do an act of charity or murder a neighbor's babe. You will find a passage that will exactly fit the case. So that I can say that I am still for the reasonable, for the natural, I am still opposed to the absurd and supernatural. Is there any better or more ennobling belief than Christianity? And if so, what is it? There are many good things, of course, in every religion, or they would not have existed. Plenty of good precepts in Christianity, but the thing that I object to more than all others is the doctrine of eternal punishment, 
the idea of hell for many and heaven for the few take from christianity the doctrine of eternal punishment and i have no particular objection to what is generally preached if you will take that away and all the supernatural connection with it i have no objection but that doctrine of eternal punishment tends to harden the human heart it has produced more misery than all the other doctrines in the world it has shed more blood it has made more martyrs it has lighted the fires of persecution and kept the sword of cruelty wet with heroic blood for at least a thousand years there is no crime that the doctrine has not produced i think it would be impossible for the imagination to conceive of a worse religion than orthodox christianity utterly impossible a doctrine that divides this world a doctrine that divides families a doctrine that teaches the son that he can be happy with his mother in perdition the husband that he can be happy in heaven while his wife suffers the agonies of hell this doctrine is infinite injustice and tends to subvert all ideas of justice in the human heart i think it would be impossible to conceive of a doctrine better calculated to make wild beasts of men than that in fact that doctrine was born of all the wild beast there is in man it was born of infinite revenge think of preaching that you must believe that a certain being was the son of god no matter whether your reason is convinced or not suppose one should meet we will say on london bridge a man clad in rags and he should stop us and say my friend i wish to talk with you a moment i am the rightful king of great britain and you should say to him well my dinner is waiting i have no time to bother about who the king of england is and then he should meet another and insist on his stopping while he pulled out some papers to show that he was the rightful king of england and the other man should say i have got business here my friend I am selling goods, and I have no time to bother my head about who the King of England is. No doubt you are the King of England, but you don't look like him. And then suppose he stops another man, and makes the same statement to him. And the other man should laugh at him and say, I don't want to hear anything on this subject. You are crazy. You ought to go to some insane asylum, or put something on your head to keep you cool. And suppose, after all, it should turn out that the man was King of England and should afterward make his claim good and be crowned in Westminster. What would we think of that king if he should hunt up the gentlemen that he met on London Bridge, and have their heads cut off because they had no faith that he was the rightful heir? And what would we think of a god now who would damn a man eighteen hundred years after the event, because he did not believe that he was God at the time he was living in Jerusalem? not only damn the fellows that he met and who did not believe him but gentlemen who lived eighteen hundred years afterward and who certainly could have known nothing of the facts except from hearsay the best religion after all is common sense a religion for this world one world at a time a religion for today we want a religion that will deal in questions in which we are interested how are we to do away with crime how are we to do away with pauperism how are we to do away with want and misery in every civilized country england is a christian nation and yet about one in six in the city of london dies in almshouses asylums prisons hospitals and jails we i suppose are a civilized nation and yet all the penitentiaries are crammed there is want on every hand and my opinion is that we had better turn our attention to this world christianity is charitable christianity spends a great deal of money but i am somewhat doubtful as to the good that is accomplished there ought to be some way to prevent crime not simply to punish it there ought to be some way to prevent pauperism not simply to relieve temporarily a pauper and if the ministers and good people belonging to the churches would spend their time investigating the affairs of this world and let the new jerusalem take care of itself i think it would be far better the church is guilty of one great contradiction the ministers are always talking about worldly people and yet were it not for worldly people who would pay the salary 
how could the church live a minute unless somebody attended to the affairs of this world the best religion in my judgment is common sense going along hand in hand with kindness and not troubling ourselves about another world until we get there i am willing for one to wait and see what kind of country it will be does the question of the inspiration of scriptures affect the beauty and benefits of christianity here and hereafter a belief in the inspiration of the scriptures has done in my judgment great harm the bible has been the breastwork for nearly everything wrong the defenders of slavery relied on the bible the bible was the real auction block on which every negro stood when he was sold I never knew a minister to preach in favor of slavery that did not take his text from the Bible. The Bible teaches persecution for opinion's sake. The Bible, that is the Old Testament, upholds polygamy. And just to the extent that men, through the Bible, have believed that slavery, religious persecution, wars of extermination, and polygamy were taught by God, just to that extent the Bible has done great harm. The idea of inspiration enslaves the human mind and debauches the human heart. Is not Christianity and the belief in God a check upon mankind in general, and thus a good thing in itself? This again brings up the question of what you mean by Christianity. But taking it for granted that you mean by Christianity the Church, then I answer, when the Church had almost absolute authority, then the world was the worst. Now, as to the other part of the question, is not a belief in God a check upon mankind in general? That is owing to what kind of God the man believes in. When mankind believed in the God of the Old Testament, I think that belief was a bad thing. The tendency was bad. I think that John Calvin, patent after Jehovah, as nearly as his health and strength would permit, man makes God in his own image, and bad men are not apt to have a very good God if they make him. I believe it is far better to have a real belief in goodness, in kindness, in honesty, and in mankind than in any supernatural being whatever. I do not suppose it would do any harm for a man to believe in a real good God, a God without revenge, a God that was not very particular in having a man believe in a doctrine whether he could understand it or not. I do not believe that a belief of that kind would do any particular harm. There is a vast difference between the God of John Calvin and the God of Henry Ward Beecher and a great difference between the God of Cardinal Pedro González de Mendoza and the God of Theodore Parker. Well, Colonel, is the world growing better or worse? I think better in some respects, and worse in others, but on the whole, better. I think that while events like the pendulum of a clock, go backward and forward, man, like the hands, goes forward. I think there is more reason and less religion, more charity and less creed. I think the church is improving. Ministers are ashamed to preach the old doctrines with the old fervour. There was a time when the pulpit controlled the pews. It is no longer. The pews know what they want, and if the minister does not furnish it, they discharge him and employ another. He is no longer an autocrat. He must bring to the market what his customers are willing to buy. What are you going to do to be saved? Well, I think I am safe anyway. I suppose I have a right to rely on what Matthew says, that if I will forgive others, God will forgive me. I suppose, if there is another world, I shall be treated very much as I treat others. I never expect to find perfect bliss anywhere. Maybe I should tire of it if I should. What I have endeavoured to do has been to put out the fires of an ignorant and cruel hell, to do what I could to destroy that dogma, to destroy the doctrine that makes the cradle as terrible as the coffin. End of Free Trade and Christianity
Section 22 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Chris Chapman. Interview Title, Beaconsfield, Lent, and Revivals. Printed in the Brooklyn Eagle, April 24, 1881. First question. What have you to say about the attack of Dr. Buckley on you and your lecture? Ingersoll's answer. I never heard of Dr. Buckley until after I had lectured in Brooklyn. He seems to think that it was extremely ill-bred in me to deliver a lecture on the liberty of man, woman, and child during Lent. Lent is just as good as any other part of the year, and no part can be too good to do good. It was not a part of my object to hurt the feelings of the Episcopalians and Catholics. If they think that there is some subtle relation between hunger and heaven, or that faith depends upon or is strengthened by famine, or that veal during Lent is the enemy of virtue, or that beef breeds blasphemy while fish feeds faith, of course all this is nothing to me. They have a right to say that vice depends upon victuals, sanctity on soup, religion on rice, and chastity on cheese that they have no right to say that a lecture on liberty is an insult to them, because they are hungry. I suppose that Lent was instituted in memory of the Saviour's fast. At one time it was supposed that only a divine being could live forty days without food. This supposition has been overthrown. It has been demonstrated by Dr. Tanner to be utterly without foundation. What possible good did it do the world for Christ to go without food for forty days? Why should we follow such an example? As a rule, hungry people are cross, contrary, obstinate, peevish, and unpleasant. A good dinner puts a man at peace with all the world, makes him generous, good-natured, and happy. He feels like kissing his wife and children. The future looks bright. He wants to help the needy. The good in him predominates, and he wonders that any man was ever stingy or cruel. Your good cook is a civilizer, and without good food, well-prepared intellectual progress is simply impossible. Most of the orthodox creeds were born of bad cooking. Bad food produced dyspepsia, and dyspepsia produced Calvinism, and Calvinism is the cancer of Christianity. Oatmeal is responsible for the worst features of Scotch Presbyterianism. Half-cooked beans account for the religion of the Puritans. Fried bacon and saleratus biscuit underlie the doctrine of state rights. Lent is a mistake, fasting is a blunder, and bad cooking is a crime. It is stated that you went to Brooklyn while Beecher and Talmadge were holding revivals, and that you did so for the purpose of breaking them up. How is this? I had not the slightest idea of interfering with the revivals. They amounted to nothing. They were not alive enough to be killed. Surely one lecture could not destroy two revivals. Still, I think that if all the persons engaged in the revivals had spent the same length of time in cleaning the streets, the good result would have been more apparent. The truth is that the old way of converting people will have to be abandoned. The Americans are getting hard to scare, and a revival without the scare is scarcely worth holding. Such maniacs as Hammond and the boy preacher fill asylums and terrify children. After saying what he has about hell, Mr. Beecher ought to know that he is not the man to conduct a revival. A revival sermon with hell left out, with the brimstone gone, with the worm that never dies, dead, and the devil absent is the broadest farce. Mr. Talmadge believes in the ancient way. With him, hell is a burning reality. He can hear the shrieks and groans. He is of that order of mind that rejoices in these things. If he could only convince others, he would be a great revivalist. He cannot terrify, he astonishes. He is the clown of the horrible, one of Jehovah's jesters. I'm not responsible for the revival failure in Brooklyn. I wish I were. I would have the happiness of knowing that I had been instrumental in preserving the sanity of my fellow men. How do you account for these attacks? It was not so much what I said that excited the wrath of the reverend gentleman as the fact that I had a great house. They contrasted their failure with my success. The fact is, the people are getting tired of the old ideas. They are beginning to think for themselves. Eternal punishment seems to them like eternal revenge. They see that Christ could not atone for the sins of others, that belief ought not to be rewarded and honest doubt punished forever. 
that good deeds are better than bad creeds, and that liberty is the rightful heritage of every soul. Were you an admirer of Lord Beaconsfield? In some respects. He was on our side during the war, and gave it as his opinion that the Union would be preserved. Mr. Gladstone congratulated Jefferson Davis on having founded a new nation. I shall never forget Beaconsfield for his kindness, nor Gladstone for his malice. Beaconsfield was an intellectual gymnast, a political athlete, one of the most adroit men in the world. He had the persistence of his race. In spite of the prejudices of 1800 years, he rose to the highest position that can be occupied by a citizen. During his administration, England again became a continental power and played her game of European chess. I have never regarded Beaconsfield as a man controlled by principle or by his heart. He was strictly a politician. He always acted as though he thought the clubs were looking at him. He knew all the arts belonging to his trade. He would have succeeded anywhere, if by succeeding is meant the attainment of position and power. But after all, such men are splendid failures. They give themselves and others a great deal of trouble. They wear the tinsel crown of temporary success and then fade from public view. They astonish the pit. They gain the applause of the galleries. But when the curtain falls, there is nothing left to benefit mankind. Beaconsfield held convictions somewhat in contempt. He had the imagination of the East, united with the ambition of an Englishman. With him, to succeed was to have done right. What do you think of him as an author? Most of his characters are like himself, puppets moved by the string of self-interest. The men are adroit, the women mostly heartless, they catch each other with false bait, they have great worldly wisdom. Their virtue and vice are mechanical, they have hearts like clocks, filled with wheels and springs, the author winds them up. In his novels, Disraeli allows us to enter the green room of his heart, we see the ropes, the pulleys, and the old masks. In all things, in politics and in literature, he was cold, cunning, accurate, able, and successful. His books will, in a little while, follow their author to their grave. After all, the good will live longest. End of Beaconsfield, Lent, and Revivals Section 23 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interview is questions read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's responses read by Phil Chenevere. Interview title, My Belief. Printed in the Philadelphia Times, September 25, 1885. Question. It is said that in the past four or five years you have changed or modified your views upon the subject of religion. Is this so? Ingersoll's answer. It is not so. The only change, if that can be called a change, is that I am more perfectly satisfied that I am right. Satisfied that what is called orthodox religion is a simple fabrication of mistaken men satisfied that there is no such thing as an inspired book and never will be satisfied that a miracle never was and never will be performed satisfied that no human being knows whether there is a god or not whether there is another life or not satisfied that the scheme of atonement is a mistake that the innocent cannot by suffering for the guilty atone for the guilt satisfied that the doctrine that salvation depends on belief is cruel and absurd, satisfied that the doctrine of eternal punishment is infamously false, satisfied that superstition is of no use to the human race, satisfied that humanity is the only true and real religion. No, I have not modified my views. I detect new absurdities every day in the popular belief. Every day the whole thing becomes more and more absurd. Of course, there are hundreds and thousands of most excellent people who believe in orthodox religion, people for whose good qualities I have the greatest respect, people who have good ideas on most other subjects, good citizens, good fathers, husbands, wives, and children, good in 
spite of their religion. I do not attack people. I attack the mistakes of people. Orthodoxy is getting weaker every day. Do you believe in the existence of a supreme being? I do not believe in any supreme personality or in any supreme being who made the universe and governs nature. I do not say that there is no such being. All I say is that I do not believe that such a being exists. I know nothing on the subject except that I know that I do not know, and that nobody else knows. But if there is such a being, he certainly never wrote the Old Testament. You will understand my position. I do not say that a supreme being does not exist, but I do say that I do not believe such a being exists. The universe, embracing all that is, all atoms, all stars, each grain of sand, and all the constellations, each thought and dream of animal and man, all matter and all force, all doubt and all belief, all virtue and all crime, all joy and all pain, all growth and all decay, is all there is. It does not act because it is moved from without. It acts from within. It is actor and subject, means and end. It is infinite. The infinite cannot have been created. It is indestructible, and that which cannot be destroyed was not created. I am a pantheist. Don't you think the belief of the agnostic is more satisfactory to the believer than that of the atheist? There is no difference. The agnostic is an atheist. The atheist is an agnostic. The agnostic says, I do not know, but I do not believe there is any God. The atheist says the same. The orthodox Christian says he knows there is a God. But we know that he does not know. He simply believes. He cannot know. The atheist cannot know that God does not exist. Haven't you just the faintest glimmer of a hope that in some future state you will meet and be reunited with those who are dear to you in this? I have no particular desire to be destroyed. I am willing to go to heaven if there is such a place, and enjoy myself for ever and ever. It would give me infinite satisfaction to know that all mankind are to be happy for ever. Infidels love their wives and children as well as Christians do theirs. I have never said a word against heaven, never said a word against the idea of immortality. On the contrary, I have said all I could truthfully say in favor of the idea that we shall live again. I most sincerely hope that there is another world, better than this, where all the broken ties of love will be united. It is the other place I have been fighting. Better that all of us should sleep the sleep of death forever than that some should suffer pain forever. If in order to have a heaven there must be a hell, then I say, away with them both. My doctrine puts the bow of hope over every grave. My doctrine takes from every mother's heart the fear of hell. No good man would enjoy himself in heaven with his friends in hell. No good God could enjoy himself in heaven with millions of his poor, helpless mistakes in hell. The orthodox idea of heaven, with God an eternal inquisitor, a few heartless angels and some redeemed orthodox, all enjoying themselves, while the vast multitude will weep in the rayless gloom of God's eternal dungeon, is not calculated to make man good or happy. I am doing what I can to civilize the churches, humanize the preachers, and get the fear of hell out of the human heart. In this business I am meeting with great success. End of my belief. Section twenty four of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewers' Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 
Ingersoll's Responses, read by Herman Roskams. Interviewed title, Labor Question and Socialism, published in the New York World, October 26, 1886. First question, what do you think of Henry George for mayor? Ingersoll's answer. Several objections have been urged, not to what Mr. George has done, but to what Mr. George has thought, and he is the only candidate up to this time against whom a charge of this character could be made. Among other things, he seems to have entertained an idea to the effect that a few men should not own the entire earth, that a child coming into the world has a right to standing room, and that before he walks, his mother has a right to standing room while she holds him. He insists that if it were possible to bottle the air and sell it as we do mineral water, it would be hardly fair for the capitalists of the world to embark in such a speculation, especially where millions were allowed to die simply because they were not able to buy breasts at pool prices. Mr. George seems to think that the time will come when capital will be intelligent enough and civilized enough to take care of itself. He has a dream that poverty and crime and all the evils that go hand in hand with partial famine with lack of labor and all the diseases born of living in huts and cellars, born of poor food and poor clothing and of bad habits, will disappear, and that the world will be really fit to live in. He goes so far as to insist that men ought to have more than twenty-three or twenty-four dollars a month for digging coal, and that they ought not to be compelled to spend that money in the store or saloon of the proprietor of the mine. He has also stated on several occasions that a man ought not to drive a street car for sixteen or eighteen hours a day that even a streetcar driver ought to have the privilege now and then of seeing his wife, or at least one of his children awake. And he has gone so far as to say that a letter carrier ought not to work longer in each day for the United States than he would for a civilized individual, to people that imagine that this world is already perfection, that the condition of no one should be better except their own. These ideas seem dangerous. A man who has already amassed a million, and who has no fear for the future, and who says, I will employ the cheapest labor, and make men work as long as they can possibly endure the toil, will regard Mr. George as an impractical man. It is very probable that all of us will be dead before all the theories of Mr. George are put in practice. Some of them, however, may at some time benefit mankind, and, so far as I am concerned, I am willing to help hasten the day, although it may not come while I live. I do not know that I agree with many of the theories of Mr. George. I know that I do not agree with some of them, but there is one thing in which I do agree with him, and that is, in his effort to benefit the human race, in his effort to do away with some of the evils that now afflict mankind. I sympathize with him in his endeavor to shorten the hours of labor, to increase the well-being of laboring men, to give them better houses, better food, and in every way to lighten the burdens that now bear upon their bold backs. 
it may be that very little can be done by law except to see that they are not absolutely abused to see that the mines in which they work are supplied with air and with means of escape in time of danger to prevent the deforming of children by forcing upon them the labour of man to shorten the hours of toil and to give all labourers certain means above all other claims for their works it is easy to see that in this direction something may be done by law colonel ingersoll are you a socialist i am an individualist instead of a socialist i am a believer in individuality and in each individual taking care of himself and i want the government to do just as little as it can consistently with the safety of the nation and i want as little law as possible only as much as will protect life reputation and property by punishing criminals and by enforcing honest contracts but if a government gives privileges to a few the few must not oppress the many the government has no right to bestow any privilege upon any man or upon any corporation except for the public good that which is a special privilege to the few should be a special benefit to the many and whenever the privileged few abuse the privilege so that it becomes a curse to the many the privilege whatever it is should be withdrawn i do not pretend to know enough to suggest a remedy for all the evils of society i doubt if one human mind could take into consideration the almost infinite number of factors entering into such a problem and this fact that no one knows is the excuse for trying while i may not believe that a certain theory will work still if i feel sure it will do no harm i am willing to see it tried do you think that mr george would make a good mayor i presume he would he is a thoughtful prudent man his reputation for honesty has never so far as i know been called in question it certainly does not take a genius to be mayor of new york if so there have been some years when there was hardly a mayor i take it that a clear-headed honest man whose only object is to do his duty and with courage enough to stand by his conscience would be a good mayor of new york or of any other city are you in sympathy with the working men and their objects i am in sympathy with laboring men of all kinds whether they labor with hand or brain the knights of labor i believe do not allow a lawyer to become a member i am somewhat wider in my sympathies no man in the world struggle more heroically no man in the world had suffered more or carried a heavier cross or worn a sharper crown of thorns than those that have produced what we call the literature of our race so my sympathies extend all the way from hot carriers to sculptors from well diggers to astronomers if the objects of the laboring men are to improve their condition without injuring others to have homes and firesides and wives and children plenty to eat good clothes to wear to develop their minds to educate their children in short to become prosperous and civilized i sympathize with them and hope they will succeed i have not the slightest sympathy with those that wish to accomplish all these objects through brute force a nihilist may be forgiven in russia may even be praised in russia a socialist may be forgiven in germany and certainly a home ruler can be pardoned in ireland but in the united states 
there is no place for anarchist, socialist or dynamite. In this country, the political power has been fairly divided. Poverty has just as many votes as wealth. No man can be so poor as not to have a ballot. No man is rich enough to have two. And no man can buy another vote unless somebody is mean enough and contentable enough to sell. And if he does sell his vote, he never should complain about the laws or their administration. So the foolish and the wise are on an equality. And the political power of this country is divided so that each man is sovereign. Now the laboring people are largely in the majority in this country. If there are any laws oppressing them, they should have them repealed. I want the laboring people, and by the word laboring now I include only the men that they include by that word, to unite. I want them to show that they have the intelligence to act together and sense enough to vote for a friend. I want them to convince both the other great parties that they cannot be purchased. This will be an immense step in the right direction. I have sometimes thought that I should like to see the laboring men in power so that they would realize how little after all can be done by law. All that any man should ask, so far as the government is concerned, is a fair chance to compete with his neighbors. Personally, I am for the abolition of all special privileges that are not for the general good. My principal hope of the future is the civilization of my race, the development not only of the brain, but of the heart. I believe the time will come when we shall stop raising failures, when we shall know something of the laws governing human beings. I believe the time will come when we shall not produce deformed persons, natural criminals. In other words, I think the world is going to grow better and better. This may not happen to this nation or to what we call our race, but it may happen to some other race, and all that we do in the right direction hastens that day and that race. Do you think that the old parties are about to die? It is very hard to say. The country is not old enough for tables of mortality to have been calculated upon parties. I suppose a party, like anything else, has a period of youth, of manhood and decay. The Democratic Party is not that. Some men grow physically strong as they grow mentally weak. The Democratic Party lived out of office and in disgrace for twenty-five years and lived to elect the president. If the Democratic Party could live on this grace for twenty-five years, it now looks as though the Republican Party, on the memory of its glory and of its wonderful and unparalleled achievements, might manage to creep along for a few years more. This ends our interview on the labor question and socialism. Section 25 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Herman Ruskins. Interview Title, Atheism and Citizenship, published in the New York Herald, August 8, 1886. First question. 
have you noticed the decision of mr nathaniel jarvis jr clerk of the naturalization bureau of the court of common pleas that an atheist cannot become a citizen yes but i do not think it necessary for a man to be a theist in order to become or to remain a citizen of this country the various laws from seventeen ninety up to eighteen twenty eight provided that a person wishing to be naturalized might make an oath or affirmation the first exception you will find in the revised statutes of the united states passed in eighteen seventy three to seventy four section two thousand one hundred sixty five as follows an alien may be admitted to become a citizen of the united states in the following manner and not otherwise first he shall declare an oath before a circuit or district court of the united states etc i suppose mr jarvis felt it to be his duty to comply with this section in this section there is nothing about affirmation only the word oath is used and mr jarvis came to the conclusion that an atheist could not take an oath and therefore could not declare his intention legally to become a citizen of the united states undoubtedly mr jarvis felt it his duty to stand by the law and to see to it that nobody should become a citizen of this country who had not the well-defined belief in the existence of a being that he could not define and that no man has ever been able to define in other words that he should be perfectly convinced that there is a being without body parts or passions who presides over the destinies of this world and more especially those of new york in and about that part known as city hall park was not mr jarvis right in standing by the law if mr jarvis is right neither humboldt nor darwin could have become a citizen of the united states wagner the greatest of musicians not being able to take an oath would have been left an alien under this ruling heckel spencer and tyndall would be denied citizenship that this to say the six greatest men produced by the human race in the nineteenth century were and are unfit to be citizens of the united states those who have placed the human race in debt cannot be citizens of the republic on the other hand the ignorant wife-beater the criminal the pauper raised in the workhouse could take the necessary oath and would be welcomed by new york with arms outstretched as she would fly you have quoted one statute is there no other applicable to this case i am coming to that if mr jarvis will take the pains to read not only the law of naturalization in section two thousand one hundred sixty five of the revised statutes of the united states but the very first chapter of the book title i he will find in the very first section this sentence the requirements of any oath shall be deemed complied with by making affirmation in official form this applies to section two thousand one hundred sixty five of course an atheist can affirm and the statute provides that wherever an oath is required affirmation may be made did you read the recent action of judge o'gorman of the superior court in refusing naturalization papers to an applicant because he had not read the constitution of the united states i did the united states constitution is a very important document a good sound document but 
it is talked about a great deal more than it is read i'll venture that you may commence at the battery to interview merchants and other businessmen about the constitution and you will talk with a hundred before you will find one who has ever read it this ends our interview atheism and citizenship section 26 of selected interviews with robert g ingersoll volume one this librivox recording is in the public domain prologue and interviewers questions read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana ingersoll's responses read by claudia salto interview title the funeral of john g mills and immortality printed in the post washington d c april thirtieth eighteen eighty three Robert G. Ingersoll rarely takes the trouble to answer critics. His recent address over the dead body of his friend, John G. Mills, has called forth a storm of denunciation from nearly every pulpit in the country. The writer called at the colonel's office in New York Avenue yesterday and asked him to reply to some of the points made against him. Reluctantly, he assented. First question. Have you seen the recent clerical strictures upon your doctrines? Ingersoll's answer. There are always people kind enough to send me anything they have the slightest reason to think I do not care to read. They seem to be animated by a missionary spirit and apparently want to be in a position when they see me in hell to exclaim, You can't blame me! I sent you all the impudent articles I saw, and if you died unconverted, it was no fault of mine. Did you notice that a Washington clergyman said that the very fact that you were allowed to speak at the funeral was in itself a sacrilege, and that you ought to have been stopped? Yes, I saw some such story. Of course, the clergy regard marriages and funerals as the perquisites of the pulpit, and they resent any interference on the part of the pews. They look at these matters from a business point of view. They made the same cry against civil marriages. They denied that marriage was a contract, and insisted that it was a sacrament, and that it was hardly binding unless a priest had blessed it. They used to bury in consecrated ground, and had marks upon the graves, so that Gabriel might know the ones to waken. The clergy wished to make themselves essential. They must christen the babe. This gives them possession of the cradle. They must perform the ceremony of marriage. This gives them possession of the family. They must pronounce the funeral discourse. This gives them possession of the dead. Formerly they denied baptism to the children of the unbeliever, marriage to him who denied the dogmas of the church, and burial to honest men. The church wishes to control the world, and wishes to sacrifice this world for the next. Of course, I am in favor of the utmost liberty upon all these questions. When a Presbyterian dies, let a follower of John Calvin console the living by setting forth the five points. When a Catholic becomes clay, let a priest perform such ceremonies as his creed demands, and let him picture the delights of purgatory for the gratification of the living. And when one dies who does not believe in any religion, having expressed a wish that somebody say a few words above his remains, I see no reason why such a proceeding should be stopped, and, for my part, I see no sacrilege in it. 
why should the reputations of the dead and the feelings of those who live be placed at the mercy of the ministers a man dies not having been a christian and who according to the christian doctrine is doomed to eternal fire how would an honest christian minister console the widow and the fatherless children how would he dare to tell what he claims to be truth in the presence of the living the truth is the christian minister in the presence of death abandons his christianity he dare not say above the coffin the soul that once inhabited this body is now in hell he would be denounced as a brutal savage now and then a minister at a funeral has been brave enough and unmannerly enough to express his doctrine in all its hideousness of hate i was told that in chicago many years ago a young man member of a volunteer fire company was killed by the falling of a wall and at the very moment the wall struck him he was uttering a curse he was a brave and splendid man an orthodox minister sat above his coffin in the presence of his mother and mourning friends that he saw no hope for the soul of that young man the mother who was also orthodox refused to have her boy buried with such a sermon stopped the funeral took the corpse home and engaged a universalist preacher and on the next day having heard this man say that there was no place in the wide universe of god without hope and that her son would finally stand among the redeemed this mother laid her son away put flowers upon his grave and was satisfied what have you to say to the charge that you are preaching the doctrine of despair and hopelessness when they have the comforting assurances of the christian religion to offer all i have to say is this if the christian religion is true as commonly preached and when i speak of christianity i speak of the orthodox christianity of the day if that be true those whom i have loved the best are now in torment those to whom i am most deeply indebted are now suffering the vengeance of god if this religion be true the future is of no value to me i care nothing about heaven unless the ones i love and have loved are there i know nothing about the angels i might not like them and they might not like me i would rather meet there the ones who have loved me here the ones who would have died for me and for whom i would have died and if we are to be eternally divided not because we differed in our views of justice not because we differed about friendship or love or candor or the nobility of human action but because we differed in belief about the atonement or baptism or the inspiration of the scriptures and if some of us are to be in heaven and some in hell then for my part i prefer eternal sleep to me the doctrine of annihilation is infinitely more consoling than the probable separation preached by the orthodox clergy of our time of course even if there be a god i like persons that i know better than i can like him we have more in common i know more about them and how is it possible for me to love the infinite and unknown better than the ones i know why not have the courage to say that if there be a god all i know about him i know by knowing myself and my friends by knowing others and after all is not a noble man is not a pure woman the finest revelation we have of god if there be one 
of what use is it to be false to ourselves what moral quality is there in theological pretense why should a man say that he loves god better than he does his wife or his children or his brother or his sister or his warm true friend several ministers have objected to what i said about my friend mr mills on the ground that it was not calculated to console the living mr mills was not a christian he denied the inspiration of the scriptures he believed that restitution was the best repentance and that after all sin is a mistake he was not a believer in total depravity or in the atonement he denied these things he was an unbeliever now let me ask what consolation could a christian minister have given to his family he could have said to the widow and the orphans to the brother and sister your husband your father your brother is now in hell dry your tears weep not for him but try and save yourselves he has been damned as a warning to you care no more for him why should you weep over the grave of a man whom god thinks fit only to be eternally tormented why should you love the memory of one whom god hates the minister could have said he had an opportunity he did not take it the lifeboat was lowered he would not get in he has been drowned and the waves of god's wrath will sweep over him for ever this is the consolation of christianity and the only honest consolation that christianity can have for the widow and orphans of an unbeliever suppose however that the christian minister has too tender a heart to tell what he believes to be the truth then he can say to the sorrowing friends perhaps the man repented before he died perhaps he is not in hell perhaps you may meet him in heaven and this perhaps is a consolation not growing out of christianity but out of the politeness of the preacher out of paganism do you not think that the bible has consolation for those who have lost their friends there is about the old testament this strange fact i find in it no burial service there is in it i believe from the first mistake in genesis to the last curse in malachi not one word said over the dead as to their place and state when abraham died nobody said he is still alive he is in another world when the prophets passed away not one word was said as to the heaven to which they had gone in the old testament saul inquired of the witch and samuel rose samuel did not pretend that he had been living or that he was alive but asked why hast thou disquieted me he did not pretend to have come from another world and when david speaks of his son saying that he could not come back to him but that he david could go to his son that is but saying that he too must die there is not in the old testament one hope of immortality it is expressly asserted that there is no difference between the man and beast that as the one dieth so dieth the other there is one little passage in job which commentators have endeavoured to twist into a hope of immortality here is a book of hundreds and hundreds of pages and hundreds and hundreds of chapters a revelation from god and in it one little passage which by a mistranslation is tortured into saying something about another life and this is the old testament 
i have sometimes thought that the jews when slaves in egypt were mostly occupied in building tombs for mummies and that they became so utterly disgusted with that kind of work that the moment they founded a nation for themselves they went out of the tomb business the egyptians were believers in immortality and spent almost their entire substance upon the dead the living were impoverished to enrich the dead the grave absorbed the wealth of egypt the industry of a nation was buried certainly the old testament has nothing clearly in favour of immortality in the new testament we are told about the kingdom of heaven that it is at hand and about who shall be worthy but it is hard to tell what is meant by the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of heaven was apparently to be in this world and it was about to commence the devil was to be chained for a thousand years the wicked were to be burned up and christ and his followers were to enjoy the earth this certainly was the doctrine of paul when he says behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality according to this doctrine those who were alive were to be changed and those who had died were to be raised from the dead paul certainly did not refer to any other world beyond this all these things were to happen here the new testament is made up of the fragments of many religions it is utterly inconsistent with itself and there is not a particle of evidence of the resurrection and ascension of christ neither in the nature of things could there be it is a thousand times more probable that people were mistaken than that such things occurred if christ really rose from the dead he should have shown himself not simply to his disciples but to the very men who crucified him to herod to the high priest to pilate he should have made a triumphal entry into jerusalem after his resurrection instead of before he should have shown himself to the sadducees to those who denied the existence of spirit take from the new testament its doctrine of eternal pain the idea that we can please god by acts of self-denial that can do no good to others take away all its miracles and i have no objection to all the good things in it no objection to the hope of a future life if such a hope is expressed not the slightest and i would not for the world say anything to take from any mind a hope in which dwells the least comfort but a doctrine that dooms a large majority of mankind to eternal flames ought not to be called a consolation what i say is that the writers of the new testament knew no more about the future state than i do and no less the horizon of life has never been pierced the veil between time and what is called eternity has never been raised so far as i know and i say of the dead what all others must say if they say only what they know there is no particular consolation in a guess 
not knowing what the future has in store for the human race it is far better to prophesy good than evil it is better to hope that the night has a dawn that the sky has a star than to build a heaven for the few and a hell for the many it is better to leave your dead in doubt than in fire better that they should sleep in shadow than in the lurid flames of perdition and so i say and always have said let us hope for the best the minister asks what right have you to hope it is sacrilegious in you but whether the clergy like it or not i shall always express my real opinion and shall always be glad to say to those who mourn there is in death as i believe nothing worse than sleep hope for as much better as you can under the seven hued arch let the dead rest throw away the bible and you throw away the fear of hell but the hope of another life remains because the hope does not depend upon a book it depends upon the heart upon human affection the fear so far as this generation is concerned is born of the book and that part of the book was born of savagery whatever of hope is in the book is born as i said before of human affection and the higher our civilization the greater the affection i had rather rest my hope of something beyond the grave upon the human heart than upon what they call the scriptures because there i find mingled with the hope of something good the threat of infinite evil among the thistles thorns and briars of the bible is one pale and sickly flower of hope among all its wild beasts and fowls only one bird flies heavenward i prefer the hope without the thorns without the briars thistles hyenas and serpents do you not know that it is claimed that immortality was brought to light in the new testament that that in fact was the principal mission of christ i know that christians claim that the doctrine of immortality was first taught in the new testament they also claim that the highest morality was found there both these claims are utterly without foundation thousands of years before christ was born thousands of years before moses saw the light the doctrine of immortality was preached by the priests of osiris and isis funeral discourses were pronounced over the dead ages before abraham existed when a man died in egypt before he was taken across the sacred lake he had a trial witnesses appeared and if he had done anything wrong for which he had not done restitution he was not taken across the lake the living friends in disgrace carried the body back and it was buried outside of what might be called consecrated ground while the ghost was supposed to wander for a hundred years often the children of the dead would endeavour to redeem the poor ghost by acts of love and kindness when he came to the spirit world there was the god anubis who weighed his heart in the scales of eternal justice and if the good deed preponderated he entered the gates of paradise if the evil he had to go back to the world and be born in the bodies of animals for the purpose of final purification at last the good deeds would outweigh the evil and according to the religion of egypt the latch string of heaven would never be drawn in until the last wanderer got home immortality was also taught in india and in fact in all the countries of antiquity 
wherever men have loved wherever they have dreamed wherever hope has spread its wings the idea of immortality has existed but nothing could be worse than the immortality promised in the new testament admitting that it is so promised eternal joy side by side with eternal pain think of living forever knowing that countless millions are suffering eternal pain how much better it would be for god to commit suicide and let all life and motion cease christianity has no consolation except for the christian and if a christian minister endeavours to console the widow of an unbeliever he must resort not to his religion but to his sympathy to the natural promptings of the heart he is compelled to say after all maybe god is not so bad as we think or maybe your husband was better than he appeared perhaps somehow in some way the dear man has squeezed in he was a good husband he was a kind father and even if he is in hell maybe he is in the temperate zone where they have occasional showers and where if the days are hot the nights are reasonably cool all i ask of christian ministers is to tell what they believe to be the truth not to borrow ideas from the pagans not to preach the mercy born of unregenerate sympathy let them tell their real doctrines if they will do that they will not have much influence if orthodox christianity is true a large majority of the men who have made this world fit to live in are now in perdition a majority of the revolutionary soldiers have been damned a majority of the men who fought for the integrity of this union a majority who were starved at libby and andersonville are now in hell do you deny the immortality of the soul i have never denied the immortality of the soul i have simply been honest i have said i do not know long ago in my lecture on the ghosts i used the following language the idea of immortality that like a sea has ebbed and flowed in the human heart with its countless waves of hope and fear beating against the shores and rocks of time and fate was not born of any book nor of any creed nor of any religion it was born of human affection and it will continue to ebb and flow beneath the mists and clouds of doubt and darkness as long as love kisses the lips of death it is the rainbow hope shining upon the tears of grief this ends our interview the funeral of john g mills and immortality Section 27 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Claudia Salto. Interview Title, Religion in Politics. Published in the Evening Express, New York City, November 19, 1880 first question how do you regard the present political situation ingersoll's answer my opinion is that the ideas of the north fought for upon the field have at last triumphed at the ballot box for several years after the rebellion was put down the southern ideas travelled north we lost west virginia new jersey connecticut new york and a great many congressional districts in other states 
we lost both houses of congress and every southern state the southern ideas reached their climax in eighteen seventy six in my judgment the tide has turned and hereafter the northern idea is going south the young men are on the republican side the old democrats are dying the cradle is beating the coffin it is a case of life and death and life is ahead the heirs outnumber the administrators what kind of a president will garfield make my opinion is that he will make as good a president as this nation ever had he is fully equipped he is a trained statesman he has discussed all the great questions that have arisen for the last eighteen years and with great ability he is a thorough scholar a conscientious student and takes an exceedingly comprehensive survey of all questions he is genial generous and candid and has all the necessary qualities of heart and brain to make a great president he has no prejudices prejudice is the child and flatterer of ignorance he is firm but not obstinate the obstinate man wants his own way the firm man stands by the right andrew johnson was obstinate lincoln was firm how do you think he will treat the south just the same as the north he will be the president of the whole country he will not execute the laws by the compass but according to the constitution i do not speak for general garfield nor by any authority from his friends no one wishes to injure the south the republican party feels in honor bound to protect all citizens white and black it must do this in order to keep its self-respect it must throw the shield of the nation over the weakest the humblest and the blackest citizen any other course is suicide no thoughtful southern man can object to this and a northern democrat knows that it is right is there a probability that mr sherman will be retained in the cabinet i have no knowledge upon that question and consequently have nothing to say my opinion about the cabinet is that general garfield is well enough acquainted with public men to choose a cabinet that will suit him and the country i have never regarded it as the proper thing to try and force a cabinet upon a president he has the right to be surrounded by his friends by men in whose judgment and in whose friendship he has the utmost confidence and i would no more think of trying to put some man in the cabinet than i would think of signing a petition that a man should marry a certain woman general garfield will i believe select his own constitutional advisers and he will take the best he knows what in your opinion is the condition of the democratic party at present it must get a new set of principles and throw away its prejudices it must demonstrate its capacity to govern the country by governing the states where it is in power in the presence of rebellion it gave up the ship the south must become republican before the north will willingly give it power that is the great ideas of nationality are greater than parties and if our flag is not large enough to protect every citizen we must add a few more stars and stripes personally i have no hatreds in this matter the present is not only the child of the past but the necessary child a statesman must deal with things as they are 
he must not be like Gladstone, who divides his time between foreign wars and amendments to the English Book of Common Prayer. How do you regard the religious question in politics? Religion is a personal matter, a matter that each individual soul should be allowed to settle for itself. No man shot in the brogans of impudence should walk into the temple of another man's soul, while every man should be governed by the highest possible considerations of the public weal, no one has the right to ask for legal assistance in the support of his particular sect. If Catholics oppose the public schools, I would not oppose them because they are Catholics, but because I am in favor of the schools. I regard the public school as the intellectual bread of life. Personally, I have no confidence in any religion that can be demonstrated only to children. I suspect all creeds that rely implicitly on mothers and nurses. That religion is the best that commends itself the strongest to men and women of education and genius. After all, the prejudices of infancy and the ignorance of the aged are a poor foundation for any system of morals or faith. I respect every honest man, and I think more of a liberal Catholic than of an illiberal infidel. The religious question should be left out of politics. You might as well decide questions of art and music by a ward caucus as to govern the longings and dreams of the soul by law. I believe in letting the sun shine whether the weeds grow or not. I can never side with Protestants if they try to put Catholics down by law, and I expect to oppose both of these until religious intolerance is regarded as a crime. Is the religious movement of which you are the chief exponent spreading? There are ten times as many free thinkers this year as there were last. Civilization is the child of free thought. The new world has drifted away from the rotting wharf of superstition. The politics of this country are being settled by the new ideas of individual liberty and parties and churches that cannot accept the new truths must perish. I want it perfectly understood that I am not a politician. I believe in liberty, and I want to see the time when every man, woman, and child will enjoy every human right. The election is over. The passions aroused by the campaign will soon subside. The sober judgment of the people will, in my opinion, endorse the result, and time will endorse the endorsement. And this concludes our interview, Religion in Politics. Section 28 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Claudia Salto. Interview Title, Shakespeare and Bacon. Printed in the Tribune, Minneapolis, Minnesota, May 31, 1891. First question. What is your opinion of Ignatius Donnelly as a literary man, irrespective of his Baconian theory? Ingersoll's answer. I know that Mr. Donnelly enjoys the reputation of being a man of decided ability, and that he is regarded by many as a great orator. He is known to me through his Baconian theory and in that, of course, I have no confidence. It is nearly as ingenious as absurd. He has spent great time, 
and has devoted much curious learning to the subject and has at last succeeded in convincing himself that shakespeare claimed that which he did not write and that bacon wrote that which he did not claim but to me the theory is without the slightest foundation mr donnelly asks can you imagine the author of such grand productions retiring to that mud house in stratford to live without a single copy of the quarto that has made his name famous what do you say yes i can shakespeare died in sixteen sixteen and the quarto was published in sixteen twenty three seven years after he was dead under these circumstances i think shakespeare ought to be excused even by those who attack him with the greatest bitterness for not having a copy of the book there is however another side to this bacon did not die until long after the quarter was published did he have a copy did he mention the copy in his will did he ever mention the quarto in any letter essay or in any way he left a library was there a copy of the plays in it has there ever been found a line from any play or sonnet in his handwriting bacon left his writings his papers all in perfect order but no plays no sonnets said nothing about plays claimed nothing on their behalf this is the other side now there is still another thing the edition of sixteen twenty three was published by shakespeare's friends heminge and condal they knew him had been with him for years and they collected most of his plays and put them in book form ben jonson wrote a preface in which he placed shakespeare above all the other poets declared that he was for all time the edition of sixteen twenty three was gotten up by actors by the friends and associates of shakespeare vouched for by dramatic writers by those who knew him this is enough how do you explain the figure quote, his soul like mazeppa was lashed naked to the wild horse of every fear and love and hate End quote. mr donnelly does not understand you it hardly seems necessary to explain a thing as simple and plain as that men are carried away by some fierce passion carried away in spite of themselves as mazeppa was carried by the wild horse to which he was lashed whether the comparison is good or bad it is at least plain nothing could tempt me to call mr donnelly's veracity in question he says that he does not understand the sentence and i most cheerfully admit that he tells the exact truth mr donnelly said that you said quote, where there is genius education seems almost unnecessary unquote. and he denounces your doctrine as the most abominable doctrine ever taught what have you to say to that in the first place i never made the remark in the next place it may be well enough to ask what education is much is taught in colleges that is of no earthly use much is taught that is hurtful there are thousands of educated men who never graduated from any college or university every observant thoughtful man is educating himself as long as he lives men are better than books observation is a great teacher a man of talent learns slowly 
he does not readily see the necessary relation that one fact bears to another a man of genius learning one fact instantly sees hundreds of others it is not necessary for such a man to attend college the world is his university every man he meets is a book every woman a volume every fact a torch and so without the aid of the so-called schools he rises to the very top shakespeare was such a man mr donnelly says that quote, the biggest myth ever on earth was shakespeare and that if francis bacon had said to the people i francis bacon a gentleman of gentlemen have been taking in secret my share of the coppers and shillings taken at the door of those low playhouses he would have been ruined if he had put the plays forth simply as poetry it would have ruined his legal reputation End quote. what do you think of this i hardly think that shakespeare was a myth he was certainly born married lived in london belonged to a company of actors went back to stratford where he had a family and died all these things do not as a rule happen to myths in addition to this those who knew him believed him to be the author of the plays bacon's friends never suspected him i do not think it would have hurt bacon to have admitted that he wrote lear and othello and that he was getting coppers and shillings to which he was justly entitled certainly not as much as for him to have written this which if fact though not in exact form he did write i francis bacon a gentleman of gentlemen have been taking coppers and shillings to which i was not entitled but which i received as bribes while sitting as a judge he has been excused for two reasons first because his salary was small and second because it was the custom for judges to receive presents bacon was a lawyer he was charged with corruption with having taken bribes with having sold his decisions he knew what the custom was and knew how small his salary was but he did not plead the custom in his defence he did not mention the smallness of the salary he confessed that he was guilty as charged his confession was deemed too general and he was called upon by the lords to make a specific confession this he did he specified the cases in which he had received the money and told how much and begged for mercy he did not make his confession as mr donnelly is reported to have said to get his fine remitted the confession was made before the fine was imposed neither do i think that the theatre in which the plays of shakespeare were represented could or should be called a low playhouse the fact that othello lear hamlet julius caesar and the other great dramas were first played in that playhouse made it the greatest building in the world the gods themselves should have occupied seats in that theatre where for the first time the greatest productions of the human mind were put upon the stage this ends our interview shakespeare and bacon Section 29 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. Interview Title, Political and Religious. 
printed in the chicago tribune november fourteenth eighteen seventy nine first question what do you think about the recent election and what will be its effect upon political matters and the issues and candidates of eighteen eighty ingersoll's answer i think the republicans have met with this almost universal success on account first of the position taken by the democracy on the currency question that is to say the party was divided and was willing to go in partnership with anybody whatever their doctrines might be for the sake of success in that particular locality the republican party felt it of paramount importance not only to pay the debt but to pay it in that which the world regards as money the next reason for the victory is the position assumed by the democracy in congress during the called session the threats they then made of what they would do in the event that the executive did not comply with their demands showed that the spirit of the party had not been chastened to any considerable extent by the late war the people of this country will not in my judgment allow the south to take charge of this country until they show their ability to protect the rights of citizens in their respective states then as you regard the victories they are largely due to a firm adherence to principle and the failure of the democratic party is due to their abandonment of principle and their desire to unite with anybody and everything at the sacrifice of principle to attain success yes the democratic party is a general desire for office without organization most people are democrats because they hate something most people are republicans because they love something do you think the election has brought about any particular change in the issues that will be involved in the campaign of 1880? I think the only issue is who shall rule the country. Do you think, then, the question of state rights, hard or soft money, and other questions that have been prominent in the campaign are practically settled and so regarded by the people? I think the money question is absolutely. I think the question of state rights is dead, except that it can still be used to defeat the democracy. It is what might be called a convenient political corpse. Now, to leave the political field and go to the religious at one jump, since your last visit here, much has been said and written and published to the effect that a great change, or a considerable change at least, had taken place in your religious or irreligious views. I would like to know if that is so. The only change that has occurred in my religious views is the result of finding more and more arguments in favor of my position, and, as a consequence, if there is any difference, I am stronger in my convictions than ever before. I would like to know something of the history of your religious views. I may say right here that the Christian idea that any God can make me his friend by killing mine is about a great mistake as could be made. They seem to have the idea that just as soon as God kills all the people that a person loves, he will then begin to love the Lord. What drew my attention first to these questions was the doctrine of eternal punishment. This was so abhorrent to my mind that I began to hate the book in which it was taught. Then, in reading law, going back to find the origin of laws, I found one had to go but a little way before the legislator and priest united. This led me to a study of a good many of the religions of the world. At first I was greatly astonished to find most of them better than ours. I then studied our own system to the best of my ability, and found that people were palming off upon children and upon one another as the inspired word of God, a book that upheld slavery, polygamy, and almost every other crime. Whether I am right or wrong, I became convinced that the Bible is not an inspired book and then the only question for me to settle was as to whether I should say what I believed or not. This really was not the question in my mind, because before even thinking of such a question I expressed my belief, and I simply claim that right and expect to exercise it as long as I live. I may be damned for it in the next world, but it is a great source of pleasure to me in this. 
it is reported that you are the son of a presbyterian minister yes i am the son of a new school presbyterian minister about what age were you when you began this investigation which led to your present convictions i cannot remember when i believed the bible doctrine of eternal punishment i have a dim recollection of hating jehovah when i was exceedingly small then your present convictions began to form themselves while you were listening to the teachings of religion as taught by your father yes they did did you discuss the matter with him i did for many years and before he died he utterly gave up the idea that this life is a period of probation he utterly gave up the idea of eternal punishment and before he died he had the happiness of believing that god was almost as good and generous as he was himself i suppose this gossip about a change in your religious views arose or was created by the expression used at your brother's funeral quote, in the night of death hope sees a star and listening love can hear the rustle of a wing End quote. I never willingly will destroy a solitary human hope. I have always said that I did not know whether man was or was not immortal. But years before my brother died, in a lecture entitled The Ghosts, which has since been published, I used the following words. Quote, the idea of immortality, that like a sea has ebbed and flowed in the human heart, with its countless waves of hope and fear, beating against the shores and rocks of time and fate, was not born of any book, nor of any creed, nor of any religion. It was born of human affection, and it will continue to ebb and flow beneath the mists and clouds of doubt and darkness as long as love kisses the lips of death. It is the rainbow, hope, shining upon the tears of grief." Unquote. The great objection to your teaching urged by your enemies is that you constantly tear down and never build up. I have just published a little book entitled Some Mistakes of Moses, in which I have endeavoured to give most of the arguments I have urged against the Pentateuch in a lecture I delivered under that title. The motto on the title page is, quote, A destroyer of weeds, thistles and thorns is a benefactor whether he soweth grain or not. Unquote. I cannot for my life see why one should be charged with tearing down and not rebuilding simply because he exposes a sham or detects a lie. I do not feel under any obligation to build something in the place of a detected falsehood. All I think I am under obligation to put in the place of a detected lie is the detection. Most religionists talk as if mistakes were valuable things, and they did not wish to part with them without a consideration. Just how much they regard lies worth a dozen, I do not know. If the price is reasonable, I am perfectly willing to give it, rather than to see them live and give their lives to the defence of delusions. I am firmly convinced that to be happy here will not in the least detract from our happiness in another world, should we be so fortunate as to reach another world and i cannot see the value of any philosophy that reaches beyond the intelligent happiness of the present there may be a god who will make us happy in another world if he does it will be more than he has accomplished in this i suppose that he will never have more than infinite power and never have less than infinite wisdom and why people should expect that he should do better in another world than he has in this is something that i have never been able to explain a being who has the power to prevent it and yet who allows thousands and millions of his children to starve who devours them with earthquakes who allows whole nations to be enslaved cannot in my judgment be implicitly depended upon to do justice in another world how do the clergy generally treat you? Well, of course, there are some distinctions among clergymen as among other people. Some of them are quite respectable gentlemen, especially those with whom I am not acquainted. 
I think that since the loss of my brother nothing could exceed the heartlessness of the remarks made by the average clergyman. There have been some noble exceptions, to whom I feel not only thankful, but grateful. But a very large majority have taken this occasion to say most unfeeling and brutal things. I do not ask the clergy to forgive me, but I do request that they will so act that I will not have to forgive them. I have always insisted that those who love their enemies should at least tell the truth about their friends, but I suppose, after all, that religion must be supported by the same means as those by which it was founded. Of course there are thousands of good ministers, men who are endeavouring to make the world better, and whose failure is no particular fault of their own. I have always been in doubt as to whether the clergy were a necessary or an unnecessary evil. I would like to have a positive expression of your views as to a future state. Somebody asked Confucius about another world, and his reply was, quote, How should I know anything about another world when I know so little of this? Unquote. For my part, I know nothing of any other state of existence, either before or after this and I have never become personally acquainted with anybody that did. There may be another life, and if there is, the best way to prepare for it is by making somebody happy in this. God certainly cannot afford to put a man in hell who has made a little heaven in this world. I propose simply to take my chances with the rest of the folks, and prepare to go where the people I am best acquainted with will probably settle. I cannot afford to leave the great ship and sneak off to shore in some orthodox canoe. I hope there is another life, for I would like to see how things come out in the world when I am dead. There are some people I would like to see again, and hope there are some who would not object to seeing me. But if there is no other life, I shall never know it. I do not remember a time when I did not exist, and if, when I die, that is the end, I shall not know it because the last thing I shall know is that I am alive, and if nothing is left, nothing will be left to know that I am dead, so that, so far as I am concerned, I am immortal. That is to say, I cannot recollect when I did not exist, and there never will be a time when I shall remember that I do not exist. I would like to have several millions of dollars, and I may say that I have a lively hope that some day I may be rich. But to tell you the truth, I have very little evidence of it. Our hope of immortality does not come from any religion, but nearly all religions come from that hope. The Old Testament, instead of telling us that we are immortal, tells us how we lost immortality. You will recollect that if Adam and Eve could have gotten to the tree of life, they would have eaten of its fruit and would have lived forever. But for the purpose of preventing immortality, God turned them out of the Garden of Eden, and put certain angels with swords or sabres at the gate to keep them from getting back. The Old Testament proves, if it proves anything, which I do not think it does, that there is no life after this, and the New Testament is not very specific on the subject. There are a great many opportunities for the Saviour and his Apostles to tell us about another world but they did not improve them to any great extent, and the only evidence, so far as I know, about another life is, first, that we have no evidence, and secondly, that we are rather sorry that we have not, and wish we had. That is about my position. According to your observation of men, and your reading in relation to the men and women of the world and of the church, if there is another world divided according to orthodox principles between the orthodox and the heterodox, which of the two that are known as heaven and hell would contain, in your judgment, the most good society? Since hanging has got to be a means of grace, I would prefer hell. I had a thousand times rather associate with the pagan philosophers than with the inquisitors of the Middle Ages. I certainly should prefer the worst man in Greek or Roman history to John Calvin, and I can imagine no man in the world that I would not rather sit on the same bench with than the Puritan fathers and the founders of Orthodox churches. 
I would trade off my harp any minute for a seat in the other country. All the poets will be in perdition, and the greatest thinkers, and, I should think, most of the women whose society would tend to increase the happiness of man, nearly all the painters, nearly all the sculptors, nearly all the writers of plays, nearly all the great actors, most of the best musicians, and nearly all the good fellows, the persons who know stories, who can sing songs, or will loan a friend a dollar, they will mostly all be in that country and if I did not live there permanently, I certainly would want it so I could spend my winter months there. But after all, what I really want to do is to destroy the idea of eternal punishment. That doctrine subverts all ideas of justice. That doctrine fills hell with honest men, and heaven with intellectual and moral paupers. That doctrine allows people to sin on credit. That doctrine allows the basest to be eternally happy, and the most honourable to suffer eternal pain. I think of all doctrines it is the most infinitely infamous, and would disgrace the lowest savage, and any man who believes it, and has imagination enough to understand it, has the heart of a serpent, and the conscience of a hyena. Your objective point is to destroy the doctrine of hell, is it? Yes, because the destruction of that doctrine will do away with all cant and all pretense. It will do away with all religious bigotry and persecution. It will allow every man to think and to express his thought. It will do away with bigotry in all its slimy and offensive forms. This ends our interview, Political and Religious. Section 30 of Selected Interviews with Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interviewer's Questions, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ingersoll's Responses, read by Claudia Salto. Interview Title, The Interviewer. Printed in the Morning Journal, New York, July 3, 1883. First Question. What do you think of newspaper interviewing? Ingersoll's answer. I believe that James Redpath claims to have invented the interview. This system opens all doors, does away with political pretense, betters down the fortifications of dignity and official importance, pulls masks from solemn faces, compels everybody to show his hand. The interviewer seems to be omnipresent. He is the next man after the accident. If a man should be blown up, he would likely fall on an interviewer. He is the universal interrogation point. He asks questions for a living. If the interviewer is fair and honest, he is useful if the other way he is still interesting on the whole i regard the interviewer as an exceedingly important person but whether he is good or bad he has come to stay he will interview us until we die and then ask the friends a few questions just to round the subject off what do you think the tendency of newspapers is at present? The papers of the future, I think, will be news papers. The editorial is getting shorter and shorter. The paragraphist is taking the place of the heavy man. People rather form their own opinions from the facts. Of course, Good articles will always find readers, but the dreary, doleful, philosophical dissertation has had its day. The magazines will fall heir to such articles, then religious weeklies will take them up, and then they will cease altogether. Do you think the people lead the newspapers, or do the newspapers lead them? The papers lead and are led. Most papers have for sale what people want to buy. 
as a rule the people who buy determine the character of the thing sold the reading public grow more discriminating every year and as a result are less and less led violent papers those that most freely attack private character are becoming less hurtful because they are losing their own reputations evil tends to correct itself people do not believe all they read and there is a growing tendency to wait and hear from the other side do newspapers today exercise as much influence as they did twenty-five years ago more by the facts published and less by editorials as we become more civilized we are governed less by persons and more by principles less by faith and more by fact the best of all leaders is the man who teaches people to lead themselves what would you define public opinion to be first in the widest sense the opinion of the majority including all kinds of people second in a narrower sense the opinion of the majority of the intellectual third in actual practice the opinion of those who make the most noise fourth public opinion is generally a mistake which history records and posterity repeats what do you regard as the result of your lectures in the last fifteen years i have delivered several hundred lectures the world is growing more and more liberal every day the man who is now considered orthodox a few years ago would have been denounced as an infidel people are thinking more and believing less the pulpit is losing influence in the light of modern discovery the creeds are growing laughable a theologian is an intellectual mummy and excites attention only as a curiosity supernatural religion has outlived its usefulness the miracles and wonders of the ancients will soon occupy the same tent jonah and jack the giant killer joshua and red riding hood noah and neptune will all go into the collection of the famous mother hubbard this concludes our interview the interviewer this also concludes volume one of selected interviews with robert g ingersoll